Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Yasmin Muhammad podcast. I'm going to do things a little bit differently today. Uh, normally, I'm interviewing somebody, um, but today it's going to be more of a discussion with a friend of mine named Jay Shapiro. You probably know Jay from, uh, he is the director of the Islam and the Future of Tolerance film that was created uh, based on a book that was a discussion between Sam Harris and Majid Nawaz. So he's very versed in this whole discussion that we're about to have today, which is Islamism versus Zionism, which is kind of a little clickbaity title because mm -hmm. I grew up as an Islamist or in an Islamist household, I should say. And Jay grew up in a Zionist household. And I do not call myself an Islamist today, and he does not call himself a Zionist today. I don't think we, either of us, ever called ourselves that title, ever. No, um, no I didn't. Yeah, me neither. So <laughs> we're here today to just discuss the two sides of this coin um, that has been obviously on everybody's mind since October 7th. So, Mr. Jay Shapiro, welcome. Thank you, old friend, good friend. It's great to talk to you always. Thank you. Awesome. I'm looking forward to this discussion. You and I have had a little bit of side discussions, and we've realized a lot of parallels between our backgrounds, and I'm excited to, to get into all that. But let's uh, start off with asking you about your childhood. So tell us about mm -hmm. your upbringing as a Zionist, uh, or in a Zionist household, I should say. Is your family orthodox? Are they religious? Or is yours a typical secular Jewish family? Um, so just tell me all about that life of little yeah. Jay. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely not orthodox. It's a conservative sect. If people know kind of the way at least American Judaism breaks down, you have reform, conservative, orthodox, ultra orthodox above that. And it's sort of a gradient scale of how serious you are and committed you are to the the rituals of keeping kosher and praying and speaking Hebrew and all kinds of stuff. You can almost just picture it of like, you know, uh, different levels of sort of, you know, sugar intake or something of the, of the religious tenants. So I, I grew up in a conservative household, honestly. So my story is not extreme at all. I know a lot of your, your guests and people you talk to have been through really, think, including yourself, really kind of you know, extreme situations. My story is, I think, really typical of American Judaism. Um, growing up in an American suburb, I grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania. It's about an hour north of Philadelphia for people who know it. You know, a Jewish community went to Jewish day school and kindergarten, Jewish Hebrew school, which is like, if, if everybody remembers the kids who went on a different bus, like on Tuesdays and Thursdays for a lot of elementary and into junior high, I was one of them. What happens at those schools, at least in my synagogue, it's not overly religious. It's kind of like you learn prayers, you learn how to read Hebrew. You definitely get fed a lot of Israel stuff. Um, there's like little sadaka boxes. That's like the word for charity. I remember giving coins to, you know, <laughs> they build it as planting trees in in the the Holy Land and that kind of stuff, which has its own sordid tale that we could we could get into. Um, but that was it. I had a bar mitzvah. Um and my my home life, you know, my parents were atheists. That was there was no God talk. There was no metaphysical what's gonna happen to you after you die, none of that stuff. But and this is the thing, I think most people who grew up like me, that probably sounds really innocuous and simple. You know, we had Passover and Hanukkah and that kind of stuff, probably don't realize that they're actually in what it what is sort of a Zionist kind of ecosystem just in the water, because Israel was certainly a topic that came up and really could not be criticized. I remember as my political mind started forming a bit when I was, you know, 11, 10, 12, 13, um, starting to see some of the news that I didn't quite understand of stone throwers getting shot, you know, the stuff that would come across the media. And I would start asking some questions. That's that's when <laughs> the, the pseudo religious, you know, door gets closed of don't ask any more questions. Um, this is way too complicated. Or, you know, you start learning about the Holocaust, and then it sort of just wipes everything away it just sort of clouds your entire vision under this you know cloak of never againism and you know don't you know that jews are always under threat and the nazis are returning any day now and this is just another version of it and we just have to do this kind of stuff um so that's that's kind of what i grew up with um 
and it became a much more tense um, conversation between me and my mom in particular as I got a little older. And I was supposed to go to Israel. They had saved up money for me, like just about every other Jewish kid in every other suburb. Um, I think it was after my junior year of high school. And uh, I really, really didn't want to go. Uh, by that time, I <laughs> I had I had tensions with it. I didn't know the full story of anything. But, you know, I think there's this thing, especially with a lot of teenagers that, you know, you might not know the truth of something, but you kind of know when you're being bullshitted to. <laughs> and I and I definitely had that sense and was angsty and lashing out. So anyway, I ended up going on a different trip somewhere else in my life. Uh, total credit to, to my parents for letting me do that. I have gone to Israel and Palestine and the territory since then on a few different film projects and educated myself. But um, yeah, that story probably sounds really, really normal. And it really, really is. And now looking back on it, it's such an obvious sort of ecosystem of what is only fair to say, sort of the Zionist myth of the creation of the state of Israel and its place in the world um, and never sort of being able to pierce that story. Tell me what that, what is that creation myth and how is it different from what I yeah. was taught, for example, like I just, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what you uh, heard about it or were taught about it, but I definitely was getting the slogans of a land without a people for people without land. Um, I was getting, you know, the Jews made the desert bloom. <laughs> Apparently there was nothing there before the Jews got there. Um, I, I was getting just sort of this, you know, definitely the big underdog story. You know, it's it's a small people. There's only so many of us in the world and it's in a really bad neighborhood. And so like we kind of have to just always keep our guard up. Um, but it's very much, at least in my experience, very much centered around um, the Holocaust uh, reading Eli Wiesel and just getting fed a lot of that stuff. I mean, there's obviously a ton of films from Hollywood that that you, you watch that just re repeats sort of the 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 Nazi bad guy, and and it's it's terrible. I I, I put it as um, my Hebrew school. I think when I was like 15, took everyone to the Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C., which is an incredible museum for those who haven't seen it. I mean, just beautifully beautifully done, very emotional. And I really, I, you know, looking back on it, that really is much more of the bar mitzvah kind of <laughs> joining the the coming of, of age and rite of passage into sort of a, a tribe that will entrench something for you. And it's very powerful, um, but it's very much, at least in my context, that is, that's what you need to know to take on very much before many students then go on a birthright trip. Um, to understand the context of what this Zionist project really is about and why it's important and why we can't let our guard down. Um, and so that's kind of what I was getting fed. Things I would never hear about where I was also, of course, told the Palestinians weren't a real people, that this was a made up refugee problem. Um, all of the Arab states just, you know, are using them as pawns, which of course has some political truth that we could talk about, but we're using them as pawns and kind of keeping them there and, you know, won't let them into their countries. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of what I was getting. I certainly never heard about the Nakba, never learned that word, never was taught anything about that. The story it's very much starts after World War II when it comes to what an American like me learns about Israel. After World War II, Jews from Europe that survived needed a place to call home and a safe haven and no one else would take them. And so Israel was the Holy Land. Um, that That's what I was was getting. Never, never learned about something like the Stern Gang or the Irgun or Jewish terrorism, which preceded 1948. Um, so that was that was the story. Again, it 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 sounds kind of believable, especially to a high schooler. Mm -hmm. And you you know you don't want to kind of you don't want to go past that. Um, certainly in the in the holy books, which again my family didn't take too seriously, but I was curious and I would always be reading the English translation while we were praying and whatever. And Israel is all over the Torah. I think it's like two thousand two hundred mm -hmm. mentions or something. And so the Holy Land of Israel is everywhere. The story of Passover, about ending up in the Holy Land. Um, it's just kind of there. It's in the water at the end of Passover, which is the, the the festive meal. It's traditional to say next year in Jerusalem, of course, unless you are in Jerusalem to then 
toast and and celebrate that. Um, so that was it. It was just it was just around. My older brother went on a uh, a birthright trip. Well, not birthright. I think it was called Young Judea, the summer program. Um, came home with an IDF shirt, gave one to me. So it was sort of that was the that was the world we were in. Hmm. Interesting. I'm going to try and remember all of the parallels to the world that I was in. Yeah. So first of all, uh, sadaqa, you called it sadaqa, like in Arabic, yeah. it's called sadaqa, same thing. Um, your story, it sort of sounds believable, but it's not fully believable, but you're not allowed to ask mm -hmm. questions. Same, same scenario on my side. Um, so my dad is from Gaza. So it was a lot of like, just, he's very, um, he was very passionate about the topic, whereas my mom is just very anti-Semitic about the topic. Like she just had, just has mm -hmm. pure hate for Jews and therefore Israel. And it's just like very clean, you know, but with my dad, it's more of a political disagreement. So I grew up with both of these conversations going on, which is what made me start to question because the story that mm. you're generally told is that um Palestine Palestinians were living there they were the majority and um after World War II the UK didn't know what to do with all these Jewish people who were homeless and who didn't want to be in Europe anymore because they didn't feel safe so they just carved out a piece of Palestinian land and they said here you can live here and so then they all just moved in and Palestinian people were kicked out of their homes and they were told this is now Jewish land. And mm -hmm. so it's it, what's interesting is that you get told the underdog story and I also get told the underdog story. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of power in being the underdog and being the victim, because then you can sort of justify whatever you have to do to fight the power, to fight the oppressor, to be to, to be the resistance if you see yourself yeah. as the victim in the scenario. Um, so yeah, so it was, you know, the discussions I would have with my dad were a lot more rational. Um, and then when I would talk to my mom about it, it would be more like, who cares? It doesn't matter. They should all be killed anyway. You know, it was just <laughs> like a straight up, you know? Um, but, but that's how I grew up. And I never really, you know, I, I never really got as passionate about the topic as my dad did even though he really really wanted me to but I mostly mm -hmm. just felt like um it was it was sad to me and it was frustrating to me I'm a very pragmatic person so I just felt like yep yeah, shit happened you know shit happens in every country across the globe shit is currently happening in every country across the globe but as, you know you gotta just focus on the positive and try and move forward. So it really frustrated mm. me that Palestinian people would not just, um, or I'm specifically going to be talking about Gaza here, Gazan people could not just like accept that Israel, like they still talk about like, we're going to annihilate Israel, is we're going to get rid of the Jewish people as if it's like, still as if it's some reality for them, like they really truly think that this that this can happen. Um, and they will never just sort of, my biggest frustration was like just enough already with the hate and the anger and the resentment and the just spend your time and energy in bringing each other up and bringing, you have space now, especially in Gaza since, you know, they had like an independent area, um, do something positive with it. But instead it was bring in Hamas, bring in terrorists, you know, everybody was hush hush about the terrorists building their tunnels and everything like there, there was the, the hate was still um, the, the blood that coursed through the veins, you know what I mean? Like it was, it was still the major thoroughfare. It was still the main uh, uniting factor. And the hate comes from either like, would either come from the side of like they are our occupiers and we hate them and this was our land and they took it we were being good to them we were being kind to them we welcomed them with open arms because they were refugees and then they took our homes so the anger can come from there or the anger can come from a straight up religious place of just like we hate them god hates them so we must hate them too because that's what uh that's what a good muslim is supposed to do so um 
Yeah. So that's why I never really bought into it. My, I couldn't get passionate about the topic the way he could, because I just felt like this is just stupid. This is a waste of time and it's irritating and you're putting your energy in the wrong direction. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I can um, respond to some of it. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was just how I, you know, that that was just like the story I was told growing up versus the story you were told mm -hmm. growing up. And neither of our stories, I think, were were fully complete because, of course, they're going to try and, like I was saying, position, you know, whatever yeah. side you're on as the underdog or the good guy or the one that is... Um, and that's easy to do for both of us. It's easy to do. It's very easy to do when you have, when we learn about the Holocaust and it's mm -hmm. very easy to do when you, you know, the, the one main lie that I was told my whole life that I only discovered as an adult actually um, was that there was no Palestinian state. I didn't know that mm -hmm. we were told that there was a Palestinian state and I mean, I learned now that, yes, they're Palestine, but it referred to like Israelis or sorry, Jewish and Muslim people. Um, like, I think it was like Golda Meir was officially a Palestinian, you know, according to mm -hmm. her passport, her papers. Well, it, was, it was in the, the British mandate, but yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, but we were told that Palestine was Arab land that um and i remember asking my dad like how come you don't have a palestinian passport though or something like that like you know there was no hmm. it's 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 a nebulous et, um ethnicity like a kurd or something like that because it's not they don't have a state yeah uh, but i didn't know that i thought we had a state um so anyway lots of lots of lies that i discovered <laughs> as i grew up as i'm sure you did too um but before we go further into the conversation, I want to yeah. define the term Zionist because we've you've mm. used the term a lot. And I think that it means something different to different people. I'll tell you what yeah. I think it means and what I'm mm. discovering. People are not using it as such. Um, to me, a Zionist was just it's it's almost like a, a a term that we don't need anymore because it's a term for people that were trying to that believed that there needed to be a state for Jewish people. They were trying, they were people that were trying to build a state for Jewish people. They were people that believed that there should be one little sliver of land on this planet where Jewish people can go and feel safe and protected. And that was like the Zionist project. Mm. Um, but you go ahead and tell me your your definition. Yeah. So I, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I appreciate your story and yeah there are parallels there it's really interesting about sort of uh especially the underdog stories so just as a little preamble um you watched it i put out a long sort of personal essay about my response to uh, particularly a lot of arguments that sam harris is making and i said many times in in the conversation or in the essay it wasn't meant to be personal sam is just a really good stand in frankly for arguments i've heard my entire life and he's just so eloquent at making them that i was <laughs> i just picked on him um, but you know, he had this line, this is the tricky part. I want to talk a lot about history and I'm going to answer your Zionism question because he had this line about, you know, there's two sides to the story of the way that Jews and Palestinians came to fight over the land. And then he goes on to talk about, um, but there's really not two sides to the present and he's making a different sort of moral argument that we could talk about, but, but you know, the, it's really hard. The two, I, I want to know how you or anybody thinks when there's two stories about a specific history, something like that question, how the Jews and Palestinians came to fight over the, the land of Palestine. Um, and the two stories are incompatible. I mean, these aren't mm -hmm. matters of perspective. These aren't matters of, oh, I can interpret it this way or that way. It's like things either happened or they didn't, and they're completely unambiguous in their meaning and interpretation. Um, is it possible to adjudicate the truth of those two stories? Or are we just stuck shrugging forever, flipping a coin? And I, and unfortunately, I don't think that's true. I think we can adjudicate them. And um, a lot of what you said there, and again, I might be, I might be wrong about this stuff. I've, I've, I've uh, I'm putting up a site uh, on my site. It's all of my links, all of my resources. I want everybody to check my work and, and check these things and help us all figure this out. But the story of how the Jews and the Palestinians came to fight over that land 
really screws the Arabs at every turn, every turn. And it's not always the Jews' fault. So they're specifically talking about, so Zion, I'll, I'll, I'll do it trying to answer, answer your question. In 1897, Theodore Herzl has the first Zionist conference in, in, uh, in Europe. He writes the you know this paper, the Judenstadt, which is very much what you said, like a state for Jews. Theodor Herzl is not some religious maniac. He actually had a Christmas tree. He wasn't like a super Jew. He was pretty secular and fairly responding to kind of what you're hinting out of this concern of like anti-Semitism in Europe is pretty bad, kind of need a lifeboat here. And it's hard for us now as people in the year 2024, I think, to put ourselves in the mindset of people in the year 1897. But you have to try <laughs> to think of what the world was like then and what the British Empire was like then. They had something like, I might get the number off a little bit here, but like 111 territories all over the world, right? Like we just, we don't kind of live in that world anymore, right? Where there's a colonizing mm -hmm. empire that operates that way. We have our different versions of economic sort of relations now, but this was the age of colonialism. And Theodor Herzl and his um, fledgling, wasn't very popular Zionist movement, um, was lobbying the British Empire because that was their their ally there. They, they weren't really going to the Germans for it. And that rivalry was already heating up with this proposal of like, hey, we need a state. And this is simplifying a bit, but basically wanting to like shop on the menu of the British Empire of like, what do you got in the world, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very famous now to of the, the the Palestine plan, which of course is the one that, that won the day, but the Uganda plan, which Frank is technically in Kenya, modern day, it's like the border between them, which was number two. And Herzl actually made a case for it. I think if we all had a time machine, it would have been really interesting to see, like, could that one win out? <laughs> I think it would have gone better for everyone, but the Jews... Uh, who were a fan of his his plan for Zionism, wanted an emotional attachment to the land. And of course, there's this biblical story about Jerusalem and everything else. So Palestine won the day, whatever it is. Um, it was This was not a popular idea. But by 1917, when the Balfour Declaration is made, and uh, there's a lot of speculation and talk about why that declaration is made, I think the most true version of the story, of course, there's a lot of reasons, is the Ottoman Empire was falling, which was before the British took control of Palestine. All of those Palestinians were under Ottoman control. So a lot yeah. of the laws were there. Ottoman Empire is crumbling. World War I is raging. The Germans basically have defeated the Russians on the Eastern Front. And now we're turning their sights on the British and the allies and uh, on the other side. And <laughs> the, this little Zionism project had been sort of on the table and been pretty much ignored by by British, you know, colonizers for for quite a while, and they they start paying more attention to it. There was some immigration that was happening to Palestine between 1897 and 1917, but it was very 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 small, something like less than 10,000. And and they issued the Balfour Declaration saying, you know, we look upon with favor this project of Zionism with the other line of like, and also we're going to respect the local Arab population, which was sort of an afterthought. But the guess, the speculation is that there were very wealthy Jews. The Balfour Declaration was a letter written to the Rothschilds. And as soon as you say the name Rothschild, it like sparks all the conspiracy theories. But a lot of it starts with this, these stupid threads. Um, but the... The hope was, and it worked, and it's very debatable. I'm not going to make this case. I'm not a historian, but I'm not going to make the case that this was the reason. But Britain badly wanted America to enter World War I, of course, on the side of the Allies. And part of the effort was to promise the Zionists, hey, we're, you know, thumbs up. We like your plan. We're going to do it. Can you put some pressure? Because there was a lot of wealthy American Jews at that point to get America involved in in the the war. Um, again, whether or not that was the reason, set it aside. Britain Britain prevails. Germany is humiliated. We all know the Treaty of Versailles. It's, it's terrible. The Sykes Pico Agreement had been signed secretly. If people know that history, that the French and the British had already pre carved up what was going to happen in the Ottoman Empire, including to Palestine. So, Britain. As soon as it was ready after World War One to to take Palestine, take that area, the French took Lebanon and above, um, and Zionism then was was sort of off to the races. The British were going to try to keep this promise, and they had been making also, of course, a lot of promises to everyone. The British are, are you know, the British get off the hook a lot in what's happening in in Palestine. History really, you know, points a pretty big finger at, at Britain and World War One for for 
causing a lot of the, the strife we're in today. Um, but long story short, the Zionism project really starts to pick up steam around Europe as, of course, anti-Semitism is getting louder and louder and louder. Germany, humiliated in World War I, also clearly knew what happened with the Zionist feeds to their conspiracy theory and their hatred of Jews and their, uh, you know, uh, charges of dual loyalty and all that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of reasons why Zionism starts to get more popular as, as a... Um, as, an, as a little story in that time, because I'm telling the history of it here, people like Albert Einstein and Hannah Arendt, famous philosopher, and I love their work, of course, they're fleeing anti-Semitism in Europe, right? They see what's happening there, and they're interested in the Zionism project. They're totally secular people. Most of the Jews in Europe are not religious Jews, but they are clearly noticing it's getting kind of rough around here for us. What's the Zionism thing? So, for example, people like Hannah Arendt, and Albert Einstein are going to Zionist conferences to check out what this plan is. And already by the 1930s, they, both of them, especially Hannah famously, like basically back away being like, this is crazy. This is being taken over already by religious, racist Zionist people like Menachem Begin. And we could talk about him later who ends up joining terrorist groups or whatever. So already the Zionist project was, I would argue, um, it's hijacked. very much, yeah, being hijacked, right? Because we're, I'm sure we're going to end up talking about how, the dynamics of Islamism, but but being led by at least uh, not so secular, not so innocuous, not so peaceful people who just want to get a lifeboat out of Europe. Um, but a lot of people didn't really have a choice because Europe was was crumbling in anti-Semitism. All the doors were closed, right? And so I'm saying all this to say that Zionism <laughs> is complicated, right? Because there's a ton of motivations historically for the thing. But the, the project, as it has been expressed and delivered, and then, you know, to skip ahead, of course, the Holocaust happens, it's awful. And then we have this bigger influx. And, you know, I think people kind of know that version of the story. But by then, the Zionist ship kind of had already left the, you know, the, the station. And it was a ship that was aggressive, and had already been in very, uh, you know, violent clashes with Arabs. And you had these Jewish terrorist groups like the Irgun and the Stern Gang and the Haganah who were targeting civilians, Arab and British, because they were certainly pissed at the British for, in their words, you know, not keeping their word, not doing enough immigration. The British hated it. By the end, the British were walking away from the thing being like, we're done with this fucking territory. It's a huge headache. And, you know, we're, we're out of here. And, you know, I think it was pretty shameful of them, but they just like dropped it on the lap of the UN, which was like two years old and was like, you guys figure it out and look how, how much that has done for us. Um, so <laughs> Zionism for me, I never got taught any of that, right? Growing up. So Zionism for me didn't mean any of that. Zionism for me meant kind of what it you were framing it as, which was just, oh, the Jews need a safe place because the world's not a safe place for Jews. Like you said, a tiny sliver of the world that's safe for us can... Can we, is that too much to ask? It sounds like this little thing, but the history just really does not align with that. But of course, after the Holocaust, you, you, you get that, like you get that story and that's the story that almost erases the previous 50 years. And if anything kind of un, untoward happened in 1948 and what the Palestinians call the Nakba and the Jews call the, the, the fight for, for freedom or whatever, um, let's just not look too closely at it because it kind of just doesn't fit this kind of story that we're telling. Um, and so I, I think more and more people are discovering it and it's uncomfortable. There's historians like Elon Pape who wrote 10 myths uh, about Israel and, and, and many of them who look back at 1948 and, um, you know, <laughs> find that the story is just not so clean and it just is so uncomfortable it doesn't fit with what we want to especially the victims of the mass genocide attempts in extermination camps in europe that within one generation or zero generations are already participating in something that's kind of ugly and so you could say like shit happens and yet i i was telling the zionist story of there of course the arab side of that story is also full of violence and they weren't always the best neighbors but from their perspective, and this is, I think, a huge, huge point, um, people are, are bringing up the colonial settler 
dynamic a lot to what's happening there. I think that completely fits, completely fits, especially from the eyes of an Arab or a Palestinian who was living on the land, because they don't really care who much is showing up to take their land. Right? <laughs> to them, it's it's either a Jew who's collaborating with the colonizing power or the colonizers themselves. But, but it is a mess, right? So I, I talk about this a bit in my piece because um, I think what we miss in all of that story I just told about what Zionism is, is the, a, a huge percentage of the Jews themselves who found themselves in Israel, whether this is the ones who were fleeing from Europe or the ones who were subsequently expelled from Arab lands after 1948, really you know, didn't ask for this. They, mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, they got kind of swindled by a Zionist project that, you know, they show up in this land and someone's like, here's a house, it's empty, don't ask any questions. And they're like, I don't fucking know. Like, I just survived a Holocaust. Let me show mm -hmm. up here. Or like, I don't know, I just got kicked out of Iraq and here I am. Um, and they're paying the price for something they didn't quite ask for or forge. Again, Zionism was not a popular ideology in Europe. It was very much a, a lifeboat. In my um, conversation of these ones that I, I, I'm releasing it, 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 now at the moment, I just had a conversation, a really good one with Gideon Levy, who's an author for, uh, or a journalist for Haaretz. And he tells the story of his father, who's just like this, right? His father was on a boat fleeing Europe. Like he, he described it of like 600 people on a boat without food, just wandering through the Mediterranean, ends up getting smuggled in through a, a, a Zionist organization and finds themselves in Israel. And he's like, you know, my dad wasn't Jewish at all. He didn't practice anything. He didn't barely knew he was a Jew, but there he is, right? And so there, there's this kind of what you're saying, shit happens in history. A lot of shit happened here. And again, I'm putting a ton on the lap of the British and the colonial powers here, and I think they should get a lot of shit for it. Um, and now here we are, like we're, we're kind of, <laughs> we're, we're stuck in this situation, but the Palestinian version of the story as feeling bullied, pushed around, disrespected. Certainly, let's not forget how racist the British Empire was. This wasn't like a rare thing for them to just sort of favor the white immigrant, whoever it was, versus the not white one. Um, I think holds much more truth than the story I was told. Of course, it's not as as clean as anybody would ever tell it. But that's something that's, I, I, unfortunately, I think just hard to let go. It's hard to walk away from. I mean, they view, I'll just, I'll finish up here because I, I'm no, I've skipped ahead now, but I think it's important because we can't forget the history here. You have someone like Netanyahu now saying something like, we can't talk about having a Palestinian state because we can't reward terrorism, right? This would be a reward for terrorism. But the, the Palestinian mindset with that history very much in mind, views the Jewish state as a, a reward for colonial terrorism. And now we're stuck in this yeah. place where nobody wants to budge and give each other the W. And it's awful. I, I just, right? let's just stop here for one second, because that's true from the sort of Ashkenazi Jewish perspective, but the Sephardic Jewish perspective, mm -hmm. they were kicked out. They were thrown mm -hmm. out of their homes, whether it was Egypt yeah. or Yemen or Iraq or Syria or Morocco. So they didn't want to leave. You know, a lot of them yeah. felt, this is my home. We've been here for generations. You know, I, I don't want to go anywhere else. But they, you know, for know. in Egypt, for example, they were told, you either get out or you go to prison indefinitely. So, um, you know, they, you, you talked about them not really wanting to be part of it and, and, you know, but looking for a safe place. But with yeah. the Sephardic Jews, they weren't even looking for anything. They were just they were just literally thrown out of the home that they've lived in for generations, where they had citizenship, where they felt yeah. connected to the land. You know what I mean? You know how Arabs are so uh, uh, tribal and so um, you know you know how they are. Like they're so nationalistic. And I know that Sephardic yeah. Jews don't like to call themselves Arabs, but whether I'm talking about a, a Yemeni or a you know, an Iraqi or whatever, mm -hmm. they are all still very nationalistic. And so it was, it, it was heartbreaking. That was another lie that I was, well, not a lie that mm. I was told, but a lie that I wasn't told. Um, I didn't know that they were all kicked out of their homes. Yeah. And then they get kicked out of their homes and they get told, go to Israel. 
And then once they get to Israel, they get told, get the fuck out of here, go back where you came from. <laughs> we're going to so attack you. Like, yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. What, you know, they, they really were, uh, they were, they were in a no win, no win situation. Yeah. The, the historian Avi, uh, I always pronounce his name wrong. Shlam Shlom. He's an Iraqi Jew who has that story and it's heartbreaking. He tells the story of it. He also, and this is just like, again, the ugly sides of the histories that are, you know, histories are just never as clean as we want them to be and people exploit them. But he also tells the story of how the Mossad likely participated in synagogue bombings in Iraq to help you know, encourage the Jews to leave. And, you know, there's, there's three documented cases of it or whatever. And again, but it's a perfect example of like, I, but when you say the Ashkenazi and the Sephardic, I was actually trying to lump, and I don't know how fair this is, but a decent portion of the Ashkenazi as well, because they, you know, they didn't want to leave Europe. They left Europe because it fucking collapsed upon them and wanted them out. Right. And they and felt they, you know, unsafe. They could have. And yeah. Mm -hmm. But they weren't Zion. Like they, they weren't on board with the Zionist project. 20, 30 years ago, they they were skeptical of it, of like those crazy people who are trying to build like the, mm -hmm. you know, an, a, the, a biblical theme park in Jerusalem again, like count me out of that. But, mm -hmm. you know, when Europe collapses enough, you you um, you have nowhere to go. So again, yeah, no, I, I think it's an important thing to put in in this context here. And again, I was in Gideon Levy's conversation with me, we, we both, and I think it's useful to cast people as victims of history, including the Jews here, who, you know, I'm no fan of the way they're behaving at the moment, but I, I can sympathize with like, they, a ton of them don't know their own history, which is a problem, but they, they from the very beginning, this question about what does Zionism mean, uh, you know, they, their grandparents or whoever the first person to sort of join the project, uh, not all of them, but a ton of them, you know, didn't really ask for it either. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a mess, but I do, I, I have to admit that, that I think because of, and you know, maybe this sounds a little weird, but the power dynamics of who gets to tell the history, especially in the West growing up in America, um, I, d I think the history, you know, the needle points towards the Palestinians have a really good point, but let's not, you know, we're not going to exterminate the Jews. Like the, nothing is making a mm -hmm. case of like, let's get out of here. I mean, the, the punchline, and I'm sure we'll get to it, of my thoughts is like, they're doomed to live together and figure this out. And that's the obvious solution, not yeah. the two state. And I could talk about when maybe we'll that window there. had closed. We'll get there. I want to talk but about yeah, that. But yeah. yeah, but that's a, but that's a preview of like, um, nothing that I say, or I think anyone should say, is about sort of like ethnic cleansing in either direction. Like, no, let's let's actually have courage and get get to the solution that I think I think is the just one, even if it's a bumpy ride. I think another parallel I'm seeing here too with uh, how you're mentioning the Zionist project being sort of hijacked by the, um, the 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 religious crazies who are more militant. Mm -hmm. And obviously we saw that happen in Gaza. That's what Hamas is. That's what that whole story is. Um, but also in modern day Israel, there was a lot of that going on. So there was a lot of the, mm. obviously the the settlers were coming in and everybody's kind of turning a blind eye saying, oh yeah, they're bad, but not really doing anything about it. And then the, 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 the right wing, you know, Likud party folks, like the, 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 Orthodox Jewish people who would say some pretty uh, scary, some pretty violent, some pretty dehumanizing things about their neighbors. A lot of people didn't like them and were embarrassed by them, but they still were powerful. Mm -hmm. They still are powerful. They are powerful. And before October 7th, there was, you know, a uh, like um, the country was almost split 50 50 there were demonstrations in the streets you know every there's a lot of jewish people in israel that disagree with um with the you know with that conservative far right ideology but they have hijacked the country they really have wow. um and whenever i speak to people who live in israel who are either uh, you know, Americans or, you know, like grew up in, uh, even grew up in Israel, even their kids are part of the IDF even. And they're not necessarily Orthodox or anything like that, but they feel very suffocated by the, you know, by the 
you're parallel to the Islamists mm -hmm. <laughs> in Israel, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so that that's unfortunate that we keep on seeing these guys hijacking on both sides of the equation, you know? Um, but you yeah, didn't answer I, my question. What uh, <laughs> are you? Uh, so, so, so your definition of Zionism is very complicated. Do you consider yourself a Zionist? Do you call yourself an anti-Zionist, or do you just stay away from those terms? Uh, yeah, I, I would stay away from the term. I, I would maybe this is political. I would hope that the term actually would be viewed quite negatively if people look into the history of it. Um, these like debates that were going around of is anti-Semitism anti-Zionism or vice versa, this kind of thing that was, it was such, I mean, for anybody who knew the history, it was such utter ridiculousness to me of like, I mean, straight from the ADL, I think to get that out into the world. Um, no, I, I think but, the word but, Zionist but sometimes it is, should though. be. Some, sometimes it really is, Jay. Like my mom in public would not say, I, I hate Jews. She'd say, I hate Zionists. You know, it's just, right. it's just a right. pretty term to cover it up when you're to cover up your hate. So you say it's political but, disagreement. But would, she, but would she hate a Jew that she met in, I don't know, you know, like Alabama or something? Or would it be, would she have to know if that Jew supported the project of Israel? No, it, it's irrelevant. But it's, it, would just it was, be. she would, she hated, she's, I don't know, she hates, I don't know if she's alive or not to be perfectly honest. Um, <laughs> yeah. She hates Jewish people entirely. But yeah. it is a it is a it's a term that is used publicly. Like you'll see it on Twitter and Facebook and whatever. Like mm -hmm. in Arabic, um, nobody everybody always just said Yahud, right? But now mm -hmm. people start to use the term Zionist because it's it's a public platform and people can see what you're saying and they can, you know, claim anti-Semitism. So it's like, no, 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 it's anti-Zionism. It's just a, it's a political disagreement mm -hmm. that we have with, with Israeli people. Um, but then of course it turns into, I'm going to digress a little bit, but even after October 7th, when a lot of innocent people were being killed and not all of them were Israeli either at that music festival, they were from all over the mm -hmm. world. Their answer was, it didn't matter because they were right. on our land. They were on the occupied land. So it didn't matter that they were killed. Like they weren't going to feel any guilt over that, or they weren't even going to um, condemn Hamas for it because it's like, well, they are, they were the ones that were there. So that yeah. just shows you that their anti-Zionism really is just anti-Semitism and anti anybody who supports the state of mm -hmm. Israel either, or supports Jewish people. I'll say then that I would hope that this word Zionism would be Velcroed away from Semitism or Judaism because it needs to be. And it has yeah. been a very intentional merging of those two things my entire life with disastrous com uh, consequences to the point where, um, you know, anybody expressing an anti-Israel, me expressing it, would get called a self-hating Jew. Or whatever. If I was doing that kind of thing, I mean, it's it's the mo it's the most problematic part of this entire equation when it comes to the conversation is that the word that the term Zionism has 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 morphed into this place that cannot be you know attacked. It has no it cannot definition be anymore. Challenged, mm -hmm. yeah. There's a, yeah. There's a couple of funny comedians pointing it out, but yeah, it's like if you just mean a place a safe place for Jews in the world, I'm a Zionist. Okay, fine. I don't know how many there are of those people. If it's people who mean a safe place for Jews in the world, but it's got to be that place right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're getting a little weird here. And then it's like, mm -hmm. and everybody else has to leave. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, so it, it's 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 a term that I, I really think history should be honest about as a um, something that nobody should want to be. And I think actually we will get there. I mean, it's just an example. So I already mentioned Hunter Arendt and Albert Einstein. This is amazing letter written in 1948. Um, this is another little bit of history, but it's important, I think. So I mentioned him already, Menachem Begin. He was a, a wanted known terrorist to the British mandate. He was a part of the Irgun. They were a paramilitary gang of, of uh, violent people. They blew up the King David Hotel, killed 91 people. There are all kinds of things, all in the service of trying to establish a Jewish homeland called Eretz Yisrael. Their logo is a is a rifle with a, with a map on it. It's from the river to the sea, not the Jordan River, the Euphrates River. It's even bigger. 
um, he uh, became the prime minister of Israel later. So these aren't like fringe people, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in, in 1948, he was, uh, Israel had just been established or established itself after the, the, the vote at the UN. He was on a tour in America, kind of a, uh, you know, a, a propaganda tour, as it were, but a little like welcome to the world where Israel tour and uh, an opinion piece was written and signed by a ton of Jewish intellectuals, including Albert Einstein and Hannah Arendt in 1948, 48, printed by the New York Times. I don't have it in front of me here, but in it, he warns basically like, do not fall for this and calls it Nazi and fascist ideology. It's 1948. We're three years removed from the Holocaust. Nobody really listens even to Albert Einstein or Heiner Arendt at the time. But like, count me in on the team that's with Albert Einstein. I think he was a pretty smart guy. And I think he had a good point there. It fell on deaf ears. Menachem Begin and 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 the like kind of went on. His party, the Herut party, it meant Freedom Party, later rebranded to call themselves Likud, currently still in power. So like this lineage is still there. And so like this, it's hard. Again, it's hard to do this now, but it's time that we have to unvelcro what Zionism really means. If Zionism means expansion, I don't know how many Israelis think mm -hmm. that because you brought up the settlements and you brought up the Orthodox and you brought up everything that's happening there. You know, there's something that probably maybe a lot of people even in, in the Zoom right now heard growing up. I heard this growing up too. This is fair to to my family. They heard my disagreements with Israel and my questions and you know, they could they could say, well, Israel has a right to exist and, you know, we need a safe place to live. But the settlements, I disagree with the settlements. We should really stop doing the settlements. Probably a lot of people have heard this. And, and then they just sort of move on as if like, mm. it, as if there's no consequences, as if the settlements are not indicative at all of anything. There's just this thing that's kind of happening. And I kind of just don't, you know, I really disagree with it. We should, we should stop those. Well, how come that they have never stopped, including just today or yesterday, I think Israel announced the, the largest amount of money ever to go to them, including arming them, but announced what, 5,000 more units or something. It's like, does this mean anything? Does, is this indicative of Zion? Is that what Zionism means? Is that what Israeli government means? I, I don't know. Is this what you have to support as a Jew? And, and there's this, this ten, tendency for people to just kind of separate the, the settlements as some like sideshow that has nothing to do with Palestinian impatience and anger and frustration and everything else. And, and maybe you, we, I'm sure we'll get there maybe to the moral arguments of like, well, maybe, maybe they should just leave and give up or whatever. Um, but it, it's, it's always bothered me. So I, I don't know, does that, is that what Zionism means that we have to expand? Who gets to be a Zionist here? I would rather just forget the word and get rid of the history and be like, that's nothing that I honor at the moment. Um, and talk about how we, like you said, pragmatically, okay, what, what do we do now? History is a mess. Drop the Zionism thing. It's too, it's too dirty. You don't want it. Hopefully we can drop the Islamism thing too. I'm sure we'll get there. But, you know, how do we figure this out now? So I can't answer your question of what Zionism means. Mm. But I definitely don't want to call myself one. I definitely don't. And I don't think most okay. people should either once they start to, to poke at it. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so here we are, two pragmatic people. <laughs> we both left the extremes that we were raised in. We're trying to have, a, you know, a civil liberal conversation here in the middle and and looking at the situation as it stands and trying to figure out what's the best way for, you know, recognizing and honoring the humanity of all the people that are living on this land right now, what's the best way to move forward? Do you have um, a perspective on that? Mm -hmm. I won't call it a solution, <laughs> but yeah, do you have yeah, some ideas the... about what you think that uh, how we can move forward from here? Uh. I don't know. I mean, this is the hard question, right? I, I think it's going to take every day that goes by is setting us back to this day that I, I think will come. I, uh, at the end of my piece, I'm optimistic, right? That I think it might take like 10 years, but I do think we will get to a day. I think everybody on the Zoom hopefully will, will live to see the day that the, the walls come down and we actually achieve and yes, I'm going to, my cards on the table. I want that day to be a one state. I don't care what it's called. I don't care who gets the name. I want it to be the 
the democratic vision of a people, South Africa style, doomed to figure it out. And it's going to be insanely, insanely painful to get to that day. It looks really dark right now to get to that day. Um, obviously, right now, I want the operations, whatever we're going we're to call it in Gaza, to cease as quickly as possible and for Israel to face its political reckoning, which obviously everybody knows is coming for Netanyahu. It's unfortunately too simple to say this is a Netanyahu problem or a Likud problem. Benny Gantz, I don't think, is like a major change. But I I, I think, and this this is the, the one domino of the entire 75 year history of Israel that we have yet to see fall in a way that I don't know how it falls is if the American support of Israel starts to question itself. And clearly that's happening now. If Donald Trump wins, you know, I think blank check for four more years, obviously, and who knows what happens then. But I'm on board with the prediction that Joe Biden is the last Democratic candidate to ever be unconditionally supportive of Israel. And I don't know about the Republicans. I don't know. I don't think any of us know how this will potentially change and affect the dynamic of of Israel as as an operation, um, because this underdog story that gets told also irks me. Right? Like there's only so many Jews in the world, and there's so many Muslims, and it's this small sliver, and they're just surrounded. And I'm like, it's it's a small amount of people backed by the largest, most powerful government and military on planet Earth. So don't give me this BS about some small underdog story. That might change. Uh, when I was talking to Gideon Levy, he he actually said it straight up, saying America ruined Israel, and he related it. Uh, he he set the relationship as a drug dealer and a drug addict who's just been drunk on the the free pass again it's all emotionally understandable the free pass after the holocaust to kind of do whatever you want and this blank check and i i think what's also this this elephant in the room is the, this quote going around of, of joe biden declaring his zionism i think it was in the late 80s that it, probably everyone on this this call has has seen by now where he says something like if israel didn't exist we would have to invent it in the world to protect our interests in the region. And people seem to be forgetting that last bit. This isn't about like, because we just like love democracy and we want these good people to have a nice home. No, it's to protect our interests in the region. And mm -hmm. our interests, I'm talking about as an American here, our interests in the region are obvious and rampant. I mean, our special relationship with Saudi Arabia is, some, is a huge elephant in the room of all of this, which dates back to FDR in the 1940s. The fact that America is funding and supporting Saudi's slaughter in Yemen. I mean, talk about how awful Gaza is for the images. Yemen is this, like, I think just people are afraid to even, like, oh, unbelievable. Like, the, the combination of America and, and it's Israel been going on at work. for years. Mm -hmm. Yes, and nobody seems to care or look, right? And it's like, I think an alien could probably look at a map and guess why this country that has a lot of influence and power over here on this side of the ocean is kind of interested in like Somalia, Egypt, Yemen, Saudi Arabia. It's a pretty obvious game of risk with a waterway there. Um, I think people forget how much our world, we think we live in this, we're on a Zoom call and it's very technical, like ships are pretty important still. And like, mm -hmm. we're still like a pretty analog world, ships and and pipelines mm -hmm. and, and routes like that. Um, but all of that, being said, I think, and this, I don't know like how else to say this, clearly the global world order is shaky at the moment. And that really just means America's leadership post-World War II is really starting to crack. <laughs> and I'm not eager for that, right? I think I don't want to tear it all down. There's a lot of gains that we want to retain. But that variable in the equation when it pertains to what could happen in Israel, I think is potentially positive. And I know like this is going to sound like a crazy kind of prediction. So what I want to see happen in the short term, obviously, just just everybody chill the fuck out there and stop the killing because there's no plan. Israel had no plan when they went in. There is no day after tomorrow plan. Just chill the fuck out. We have to start talking again. And that talk that that conversation does have to be about, you know, we can't go back to the status quo of October 6th. I think everybody is on board with that. But I don't know exactly what that is going to look like in the in the near term, really. I mean, I think it just we, we need some sort of like cooling off period, which is going to be 
pretty tense, but we have to get back to conversation. And, and I honestly think it can't be the two states. So I hope, but, but this is so, Israel is so far from what I just said from accepting this, because this feels like a defeat for them being like, what do you mean? Like, who is this guy, this American to say we should let them in or something like that. But I think well, that's I, what we have to start courageously walking towards. There is a, uh, a very popular um, conservative Israeli who I had a debate with who believed the same thing, actually. He believed that yeah. it should be one state. Um, but where we disagreed, of course, was when we talked about well, who is going to lead the state? What's the right. what's the flag going to look like? You know, all those kinds of questions. So then at that point, it wasn't inclusive at all. It was still going to mm -hmm. be like, well, we'll retain the same flag. We'll, we'll retain the same uh, national anthem. You know, everything's going to be the same, yeah. but we're just going to all live together. So I'm like, oh, so basically you're just going to take over is what you're telling me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah it's uh, just, just really what I, I just want to say, like, I think we're at the, the, this like shit or get off the pot moment where it's, like I said, it's ethnic cleansing or one state. And I don't know which side gets to ethnically cleanse the other, but I'm hoping it's neither. <laughs> but that's, yeah, yeah, that's kind of where I think that's where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that's where we were at at the very beginning, you know, they're mm. under the yes. Ottoman, there were Jews and Arabs living together. Um, obviously, it wasn't ideal. The Ottomans treated them like um, lesser than they were second class citizens, they were considered dimmies, and they, they had to pay mm. special taxes and whatnot, they weren't full citizens. So that's not at, at all an ideal situation. But you know, when the Palestinians and I'm maybe the Jewish people too, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but when Palestinians tell the stories of those times, they would say like, yes, I would leave my kids with my Jewish neighbor to take care of, yeah. you know, my babies. Like we helped each other in the farming and whatever, like they were neighbors and friends. And um, even though the government saw them as two very, you know, different entities, um, or not the government, but the ruling, whatever they were, um, mm -hmm. the caliphate, but they lived together. They just saw themselves as fellow, you know, they shared the land together. I don't want to say fellow Arabs because I know that, that, um, Jewish people don't want to be considered Arabs, but they were, they, that's how they were seen. And that's how they were seen in Egypt, too. And that's how they were seen in, in Iraq and Syria and Morocco and yada, yada, until they were suddenly thrown out of their homes um, by the government, which felt like such a shocking betrayal because they didn't they didn't really know that they were so yeah. uh, that they were so disposable, I guess, is the word. <laughs> Um, and they really did feel very connected to the land. So so I don't know what it's going to look like when everybody gets to live together again. But I will tell you, there's a, as opposed to back at the beginning, there's a lot of resentment and a lot of yeah. anger and a lot of people that are going to be wanting to just take revenge. So mm -hmm. it's going to be, it's going to be very different. I lived in South Africa for a couple of years. And despite what you see on the news with them talking about we want to kill white people and stuff like that. That is true. And it is dangerous, obviously, for white farmers have been killed. And it, it's it's scary. But from my perspective, I was shocked at how gracious the Black people mm. of South Africa are. I'm like, you don't even retain any kind of animosity or resentment or they don't, they actually don't. I spoke to people who lived under apartheid. And, you know, they, they, they're, they're just happy that things are better now. Do you know what I mean? They don't yeah. have that sense of revenge. I don't think, I am sure it's not going to be the same with the Palestinian people. Yeah, I think people. it's worse. Yeah. Yeah. They, there's going to be, I, I mean, there's a, I don't know if I ever told you this, but in, uh, there's a saying in Arabic, like if something nice, if something fun, good happens, like there's good news, you say, oh, wahed Yahudi met, which means, oh, a Jewish mm -hmm. person died. Like that's like, oh, it's <laughs> yeah, the good yeah, news. Yeah. A Jewish yeah. like it's so embedded in the that kind of like just yeah. uh, I don't know, normalized hate and also almost like genocidal obsession is so commonplace. Yeah. 
So it, it will be ugly. Yeah. Um, and, and they want to take revenge now because of mm -hmm. Gaza has been flattened. And there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's yeah. going to be a lot of generations of, of anger over that. So I, I don't know what it's going to um, look like, but. Yeah. To, to, I think to um, address that, it's, um, you know, I think what humans need is acknowledgement of our pain always, whether it's a friend or a relationship or anything it is acknowledgement. And acknowledgement is really hard to deliver because it doesn't guarantee the person will just do that and be gracious. They might punch you in the face. <laughs> and like, for example, um, I'm at recommending a ton of um, films and books and stuff that I think are, are useful. And again, they're, they're open for anybody just to to think about. But there's there's a recent one that, that I thought was really good called Tantora. People may have seen it. It's a documentary about uh, a town um, in Israel uh, on on the uh, on the Mediterranean, and it explores what happened in 1948 there because there's a kibbutz there that was established and. Uh, the people living there now are, are, are older. A lot of them have those Ashkenazi stories that we started talking about of fleeing Europe and ending up there. And it sounds like this lovely little utopian place. But like many places in Israel, there's this past that is hidden, buried literally in a lot of cases. And, and the film does get into the way that the early governments right away from the beginning, Ben-Gurion on, really were pretty um, aggressive with trying to hide this history and prevent sort of the the exploration of it. The national myth of Israel was a very strong, intentional project from the beginning. But this filmmaker is poking around at what happened in Tantura because there's all of this evidence that there was a pretty obvious massacre. And there's people still alive, so it's important to grab these things as filmmakers who remember it, who remember participating in it. And it's interesting to hear them talk about it um there's likely a mass grave there that was covered up you know there's there's stuff there's an old there's a village there used to be a village and it was an arab village and it is no longer there and it's a, it's a cool film it's a beautiful film it's a challenging film it's an interesting film but the very 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 end you have these four very old jews who all have lived their life on this kibbutz kind of sitting there thinking about it and it's kind of a cool shot because you almost get like these four different psychological responses of what you do when you're sort of faced with this history and I won't get them all exactly right, but like one of them, this older man is like, you know, that's the way the world works. There's a new sign on the door, get over it. <laughs> you know, and he's just very gruff. And another one who's like, I don't believe any of it. None of it happened. Just sort of like denies the whole thing. It's all bullshit. Another one saying it just took being totally quiet. And then there's this other woman who's this very sweet or old, old, sweet old woman being like, I don't know. I think we should build a monument. And, and that's just kind of the way it goes. But the monument one is like really interesting because you're like, imagine. I mean, it's totally crazy to think, would Israel erect a monument to the, to the massacre of Tantora in the year 2024 when like, some of them might even be still alive and can like see it from the other side of the wall of like, hey, thanks for the monument. By the way, that's my house or that's my grandfather's house mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, you know, that it's 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 too much. And this is the thing. I just want to put this this thing out there because I know I've been talking a lot about history of a lot a lot of the argumentation like you said shit happens history is full of this stuff right like i gave a toll uh, talking about colonialism and whatever and like every country you dig in the history and you find massacres and genocides and ethnic cleansing and it's just like drained and blood and it's kind of awful right to know that like that's that's the problem I, I say that the problem with politics is is figuring out how the past relates to the present and figuring out what to do about that problem and there's a very stark divide between liberals and conservatives about how to think about that question that I just raised. But I think it's a real problem for all of us, um, like in that little shot on Tantora. But so in somewhere like the United States, like we have a story of just pure genocide massacres of the Native Americans. And we could tell ourselves, oh, they all died of smallpox. Aren't we so lucky that you know they, they all just happened to die? But of course, that's a part of the right. Like that's not how the world works. And but and now what are we, you know, 300 years later from some of that 200 years later, you could go to events. This happens in Australia now too. I think, you know, you can go to events where somebody's giving a concert or a talk or whatever. And before the talk, they'll, they'll give this little, you know, five minute 
speech of like, we want to acknowledge that we're on stolen land and we'll mention the Native yeah, American sure. tribe or whatever, right, a moment of silence. And it's kind of nice. And maybe the liberals in the crowd feel like, oh, you know, we've done enough. The conservatives might roll their eyes or whatever. And that's kind of the moment. And then it moves on. But the truth is, great. I, I'm all for those things. But like, there's no risk to it. There's no cost to it. There's no, you know, no one's going to come demand your house back from the like, you know, tribe that happened to be in Manhattan 300 years ago or something. Um, and it's nice. Again, I'm not, I'm not discrediting that, like, maybe we should do those kinds of things. But when, when it's so recent, <laughs> when the window to that pain is still open, like if all of us had a time machine, and we could go back to the Trail of Tears in the United States, would we just sort of like close our eyes and be like, well, in 300 years, no one will really think about this much. And then maybe we'll build a monument or two. We'd probably be horrified and be like, guys, do it differently. Stop this kind of thing. Right. Um, and, but they might have the same kind of arguments of like, dude, we just totally killed that native Americans family over there. We're, we're, he's going to, he's going to kill me <laughs> if I acknowledge it right now, or if I say anything right now, and you might cloak yourself in religious stories, which of course, the Americans did and everyone else always does of where we have a manifest destiny to this land or we're white, whatever, all the justifications come in. But that's history. Like we're stuck with it. And Israel, Palestine, a lot of, you know, a lot of people make the claim, and I think it's the right one, that it was like it was a colonial project. Again, we've already maybe talked about how the Jews themselves weren't technically like colonizers the way the French in Algeria were. They couldn't go anywhere. But the project was clearly a a um, you know a pet project of the british empire as a as a colonial project and it kind of was like as colonialism was clearly ending world war 1 style right like we 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 kind of were getting over it they kind of tried to jam one more project through the colonial window and they're still we're still kind of trying to jam it through and the people who were there the the proud stubborn palestinians to their credit, to agree, are, are digging in their heels of being like, no, we're not this one. We're not going to do it. And we're, we as a globe are kind of maybe being like, yeah, this one, I don't, I, we're going to have, we're, we're not going to be able to do this one. We just can't figure this one out. And now we're kind of stuck. And none of that is to justify the actions of Hamas or whatever. But this is, and I'm sure we'll get there. Like this is, this is the historical perspective of this moment that we're at. Um, that's a really hard one, but I, I, you know, I'm rooting for humanity and I'm hoping we do this one better. It's almost like we get a time machine to go back to the trail of tears and be like, can we do it a little differently now? Like, let's figure it out. It could have been, we could have been living in a world where Tennessee was full of native Americans along with white, but we don't, we don't live in that world. Um, and we don't think about it much, but we, we could, we could do this better. I'll add a little bit hope a little bit of hope to your hope as well um mm. and i'll say that most palestinian people honestly in my experience are they just want to live they just want to be yeah. they they just they they're not even religious people but there is an opportunity for the islamists to come in and make this a, a military project um, yeah. You know, obviously, you know that there's tons of Arabs living in Israel. I think it's something like 20%. Is mm -hmm. Arabs live better in Israel than they do in Lebanon. People don't want to talk about yeah. that, right? There's a lot of bigotry against um, Palestinians all over the Arab world. They're treated like the beggars of the Middle East. That's what they get told. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned in my book about how my my mom's family were so upset that she was going to marry a Palestinian man. Um, they said, we'd rather if you married an Egyptian garbage man than marry a Palestinian. They're nothing but beggars. And to this day, you know, I have one uncle who speaks to me and we were talking, he was talking to me about um, my niece. So this girl's got like, you know, she's got an Egyptian father. She's got a half Palestinian mother, my sister. So she's like a quarter Palestinian and he's talking about her and he says, like, he's complaining about her and he goes, Ugh, it's her Palestinian blood. Hmm. You know, yeah. This is family. And this is like, she's so far removed. She's never been to Palestine. I don't know if she's even ever met my dad, you know, but it's like, it, it it's still there. It's such a part of the, and that's just, that's across the board in the Arab world. So yeah. To be perfectly honest, when you talk about Arabs and and Israelis living together, 
it's not impossible because it's happening right no. now. 20% of Arabs are, or 20% of Israelis are Arab. Um, and I think that, and there were so many people from Gaza, I was like tens of thousands of them that would go to, um, to Israel to work. Now, obviously I know a lot of them were Hamas and they were infiltrators and they mm -hmm. were the ones that shared a lot of, um, you know, information to be able to, to hurt so many people. So obviously there were evil ones amongst them, but, you know, and they go to Israel to get, uh, support in hospitals like you know to get uh, to, to get medical treatments and stuff like they trust you're giving your child who needs surgery to a jewish person in a jewish hospital do you know what i mean like you don't you yeah. don't have that kind of hate because if you did you wouldn't trust them with your baby who is you know uh in a life and death situation so they're at the end of the day people just want to live in yeah. peace and in harmony it's the it's two things first of all it's the islamic zealots that just want to find an opportunity for fighting the same thing they did with in iraq same thing they did in libya same thing they do anywhere there's any kind of uh tension they run in there and they're like oh time to build a caliphate right yeah. so they're part of the problem and then the other part of the problem are the activists here in the west who just love their story and they just want to be a part of it. And they just want to like scream their little slogans and talk about like strippers for Gaza and, you know, whatever the heck, like yeah. the confusion. And they're just these, it's it's almost like activists want, they want bloodshed because it keeps it, it keeps it interesting. Do you know what I mean? Not mm. necessarily bloodshed, mm. but they want strife. They want strife. And it's the if you look at what what are the people in Gaza saying right now? They are so angry at Hamas. They're saying you guys have ruined our lives, mm -hmm. you've ruined our country, or you've ruined our homeland. Like, look at what Gaza is now. This is because of you. Just walk away. Just please release the terrorists and stop this bullshit. You guys are all happy. You're living comfortably. You're safe. You know what I mean? Your leaders are billionaires. You've got your your private jets. We're the ones that are suffering. It's our children that are starving. It's our homes that are being demolished. So yeah. the there there is anger towards the towards Hamas as well and towards Islamists as well. So that can give me hope that um what you're saying could possibly be a future. I don't know what it could look like, but but there, there are light. There is, there's bits of light in there that make me think that maybe mm. it could happen. Um, there, there are if a I, lot if... of people. Sorry, I just want to say one more thing. I've yeah, also yeah, yeah. spoken to a lot of LGBT people and a lot of women who have escaped um, from Jordan and from yeah. surrounding Arab areas and went to Israel because mm -hmm. that's where they could find a lot more freedom and human rights than they could in, in their home countries. So anyway, there's, yeah. there's a bit of hope I, there maybe. I, I was going to say, I actually, I'm pulling data that I, I find fascinating that is also going to be on my website, but reflects a lot of what you said about the religiosity of um, Palestinians and all that kind of stuff and the support of Hamas. It's, I think people should look at it because I don't know the stories that they think of what's happening with Palestinians. Um, it's, um, uh, I'll, I'll answer it this way. I this was I was afraid of this conversation with you for a lot of w ways because my thoughts on all of this stuff, the hardest demographic, and because you do the Forgotten Fe Feminists podcast and that's your focus, is women. I think in all mm -hmm. of my predictions of what's good, it's it's going to be rough for them. So like I because we haven't really talked a lot about the Islamist and jihadist variable in in the mix and you brought it up there and it's something that you know i made this film with sam harrison who clearly worried about that variable um it, so much so as i as i was arguing i think once it shows up he thinks all bets are off and we could argue about that all day um of, of what i think he's he's missing there but i but it is a very real phenomenon i am not when i was talking about the thing about acknowledging pain or whatever like i have no illusions that jihadism and Islam, Islamism are not real powerful forces in the world um, that 
strengthen, coalesce, ascend for all kinds of different reasons. I would, I would, mm -hmm. it's not simply the holy doctrine. It just, it is not, but obviously the doctrines themselves are captivating and shape the violence can encourage more violence. I, I think that's a fascinating conversation. We should understand better because we want to understand the phenomenon better. Um, and it's there. It obviously is a real phenomena. And, um, what I was hoping with this conversation is I get, I, I share the outrage at the Islamists in the world, including of course, in, in Hamas and in Iran. I mean, I think all of us probably on this, on this, this call watched what was happening in Iran almost a year and a half ago. And we're getting a little excited of like, Oh, maybe this time. And then it's like, no, nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. Is it, and we're all, it's like, of course we're waiting for that. And as the pragmatics that we are, I'm like, well, I hate to do this, but like the dominoes that might have to fall for that to actually happen include Israel radically de redefining itself to where the Ayatollah and all these nut jobs have no cause for resisting anymore, right? It, I mean, when as yeah, as Israel sure. and America fade, I think that revolution finally happens. But I think these next 10 years are going to be awful because Israel is going and I think that I worry about Saudi Arabia every day, right? Like Saudi Arabia is polling in, in this stuff that I'm looking at now is that almost as low as the U S like Palestinians hate Saudi Arabia almost as much as they hate the U S for supporting and normalizing relations with Israel and being Western backers and all the stuff we talked about with Yemen or whatever the, all of these countries um, you know, in my piece, I was recommending The Square, which is an amazing documentary about the Arab Spring in Egypt, and I think crucially important to follow and watch how the Muslim Brotherhood weaves in and out of that story. Um, and and the the huge number of liberal revolutionaries who can't win that fight right now, and not simply because the the Muslims are so powerful, it's because they're organized, they're coalesced, they have this mm -hmm. religious story, mm -hmm. they're ready to strike, and they and they make deals with the military dictatorships like that when they have to. And they have financial and they, backing. And they have financial backing, and they take power. But I, I do not think they are the majority in number even close to it. But these people just don't have the choices yet. Um, and I fear people might be hearing this and thinking I'm giving some Op, you know, optimistic picture. I am in the long run, but in the short term, I'm afraid we're going to see more of that, actually, frankly, because of what's happening in Gaza and Israel's uh, defensive aggression, however we're going to frame it there. The, the, what's happening there is going to ignite more and more of this. The Houthis just got like five times more stronger over the last month. And they're, they are, they were not mm -hmm. a popular group of people not too long ago, and they're getting more mm -hmm. popular, right? And this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm like, how do we get to the day that I want to see as fast as possible, I unfortunately think the path that it takes is probably, unfortunately, going to have more Islamism. And women are going to be screwed in it as usual, like as usual. As a, as a side story, um, I won't give her name, but I was making a film and I was filming with um, a, a young woman, she was like 20, uh, studying international law in, in uh, what she would call a refugee camp, everything as people know on this call in Israel and Palestine has a different name to everyone. She calls it a refugee camp, but they might call it something else, whatever. In uh, East Jerusalem near Ramallah, she went to school at Berzate University, um, studying international law, which many, many of them do. And she has she has a story, uh, you know, some brothers, and she has a younger brother who um, died in the back of an ambulance when he was stopped at a checkpoint after he had hit his head and he bled out because the Israelis wouldn't let him in, even though he was an Israeli citizen. People have these kinds of awful stories about the occupation. She has another brother in jail. And she, yeah, is no fan of the occupation for a million reasons. Very peaceful, trying to go through international law channels to, to you know, get resolutions and fight the resistance and all that. Um but she wore a hijab, not an overly religious family, but wore a hijab in solidarity, I think, with her mother and kind of wanted to take it off. She was not super married to it, right? Um, and she did to go to a friend's wedding party it, uh, and her brother found out and he broke her arm, right? And it's like, so her fight, and so it's the perfect story of like, if I could just take a, you know, a crane and drop her into Israel and start her life there, that wouldn't happen. And I know that, and you know that, but that it, 
what what I was hoping to do, that's why this conversation is so hard, especially with forgotten feminists, because they are forgotten and they're going to be forgotten more, unfortunately, is I'm hoping that the anger, rightful anger at Islamists and jihadists in the world, hijacking these things, causing such havoc, et cetera, does, the anger of that should not, I want to be a warning, turn into Zionist support. Or, 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 you know, not criticizing Israel because they're dealing with such a, um, you know, difficult enemy as, as uh, Islamism and jihadism. Um, you know, sh that's, that's what is such a thin line for me to walk in this conversation. But I've been hearing so much of just, you know, especially from people like Sam of like jihadism, Islamism is so big, it's so scary, it's so aggressive that all bets are off and I'm not going to criticize Israel no matter what they do because that problem is just too insane and and what it what it leaves out is the possibility that you are of course inflaming it I'm not the first to point out that Hamas looking at the polls right now got way more popular after you know October 7th or after Israel's response not just on October 7th people were pretty pissed about it like you said um and oddly this is an interesting thing I'm curious what you think about got much more popular in the West Bank than in than in Gaza maybe because they just don't feel the pain of it directly or they don't know how corrupt they are day to day whatever it is um but now they're they're pretty popular although a minority not or not a plurality uh, of the population wants them to remain in power after all this is done. They want, I forget his name, the, the second intifada leader who's currently in jail in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in Israel. Um, but you know, the, 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 did the Quran change? Did the doctrine change in the last three months? Right? Like it's not just the word and the, and the afterlife and the metaphysical story. Of course it gets wrapped into geopolitics. And again, that's an exhausting conversation about, how religion weaves in but i think it's an important one to to undo and of course that dynamic as we've talked a lot about on the israeli and jewish side very much plays into it as well so that's i i just i have this this uh, <laughs> this apology and this trepidation about all the women watching this forever because i i i feel for you but do not just jump into the zionist bandwagon because islamism has hurt you so much because I hate it too. We all just need to, we like, we have to fight both of them somehow rather than the, the mistake that, again, that is pointing to all like Egypt and, and the liberal revolutionaries. They kind of set their differences aside with these Islamist groups because they have a mutual sort of target at first yeah. of these military regimes. And then, you know, it's that classic, the, what is it? The, the enemy of my enemy is my friend game. And that, you know, well, that only lasts so long. So I don't think Zionism is the friend of anybody <laughs> in this world, frankly, or in, in this room, not women, even if your life would be better in Israel. So it's kind of a false choice that I'm trying to, to put out into the world, but yes, I'm no fan of Hamas. <laughs> if, that, if that had to be said. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got it. You got it out of me, finally. <laughs> All right. I'm going to open it up to to the group now and uh, see if anybody has any thoughts to share with you or any questions. There's a lot of discussion going on in the chat. I don't know if you've been able to to read it. I can't. No, I haven't seen <laughs> A lot much. of them are like <laughs> paragraph sized, so it's really difficult for me to to listen intently while also reading. Um, but uh, for anybody who did write comments in there, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask Jay the questions. So we'll start with Julia. Hi, uh, thank you for that discussion. Um, I'll start with saying that I actually am a Zionist and I'm proud to say that I don't think it has that definition that mm. Jay mentioned, but putting that aside, I do want to talk about the Israeli Palestinians, Israeli Arabs. Um, you know, I look to them as sort of the bridge kind of between the Israeli Jews and the Palestinians who are not in Israel proper. And mm -hmm. there was a poll that came out, I think a year ago, January, 2023, that 60% of them actually are for a two state solution. Um, and many, you know, Palestinians as well, less so Israelis, given the choice of the Jewish dominated. So I'm wondering why you are against the two-state solution. 
I just don't see even where it would be. I mean, literally, like this is something that a lot of people, you you go to Israel Palestine and some people just whisper. They're like, "Wait, where is this other state supposed to be? Is it going to be disconnected here? Are all the settlers going to stay?" Um, I I I think there was a potential window for it. So the historical reasons I think are it won't really solve it. Unfortunately, um, the certainly the the Jerusalem jewel in the in the crown is a big factor in it, as I think everyone knows. But I think the Palestinian memory that none of this should have happened the way that it happened, dating back to 1917, is a pretty deeply entrenched one that I I'm hoping that we can honor. But to your point, I think there was a window and Gideon Levy actually had the same kind of thought that, you know, okay, shit happens, history happens, maybe we could have just sort of paused after 1967 or somewhere in the 70s, or maybe even in the 80s with Oslo in the 90s, you know, it's tough to find the marker of when maybe we could have said, okay, stop right here. History sucks. But here we are. Let's draw a line here. Let's draw a line here. Is everybody okay with that? Um, by the 70s, settlements were already starting, so we would have to be like, can we remove those? To, I mean, Israel was never serious about it, and I don't think the Palestinians really were either. A lot of them were, but history kind of reveals that that was never really something I don't think Israel was genuinely interested in. I don't think anybody was actually interested in that piece. So... And now I think it's actually impossible. I just don't even see how it's workable. Is the proposal that you, what what are we up to? Like 700,000 settlers all just go on the other side of the 67th border where they become Palestinian citizens? Is it a true state? Is it a demilitarized thing? Do they get to control their own borders? I understand fully why Israel is like, I don't think we want that to happen. Because like I'm saying, the the the, the history from 1917 or 1897 onward, wherever you start the clock, is enough for Hamas to keep building tunnels, even when they're like, oh, we have our own state. Cool. Now we'll just keep building our tunnels and attacking. So I just, I don't think it's actually practical. And I'm not really mourning it. Like I said, I think you know, that's South Africa could have gone that way, I suppose with Swaziland or something. But um, no, I, you know, I'm not mourning the death of that, of the two state practicality, even though, I, I, again, I think there was a chance we could have taken that road. And I think Israel, frankly, with changing the facts on the ground, uh, chose the hard way. <laughs> and now we have to go through the painful way to get it. I just don't see the practicalities of it. And I don't think it's safe for Israel. I, I just don't to even do it, unfortunately. But even if they figured out all of the practicalities that I just said, I, I I don't think that's I don't think that's enough. And I don't think it's enough for Iran or whoever else. They'll still see it as a historical injustice that needs to be rectified at that point. Maybe that's unfair to Israel, but uh <laughs> that's the best I could do on that one. I uh, I don't know. Thank you, Jay. Um, I actually tend to agree with a lot of what you said. Yeah. I, I shared with you my article that I wrote on, yep. it was published on October 10th, where as soon as this happened, I was like, well, we're done. That's it. We're That's done. not going to happen. Done. We're done. Yep. Like we're there's done. no way that, that a state is going to put their citizens in the position where something like this could happen again. Like mm -hmm. Israel has to protect its people. I mean, I, I think we, I think we ended it. Sorry, I think, I think that door closed long before October seventh. When you just go through the history, I mean, Oslo was a bit of a farce too, but it probably closed somewhere in the eighties. To be honest, it's just, it's just, it just yeah. wasn't workable. Yeah. The Arafat times, yeah. Yeah. Cindy. Hi, thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to say thank you to both of you for having this conversation. It's just really. Uh, it's it's really been thought provoking, mm -hmm. and um, you know it, it's interesting to me. You know, I wanted to say to you, Yasmin, I, I'm I'm actually finding that um, your perspective seems to be a little bit closer to mine. You know, from the things that I'm hearing um, than some of the things that Jay has said, which I find kind of interesting because I am Jewish. Um, but I, I, I wanted to kind of expand on that a little bit 
in terms of what this has brought up for me. Um, maybe it's because I'm a little bit older and um, my personal situation is I'm a first generation American. My mother and my maternal grandparents were both Holocaust survivors from, um, from Austria. And I'm just really kind of surprised to hear some of your characterizations of what Zionism is, because from my perspective, it's something completely different than some of the things I heard you say. And in fact, when I was growing up, even though I went to um, a religious school for part of my education, and I was in, you know, a Jewish environment, if you would have asked me if I, if I was a Zionist, I, I don't even think I knew what that word meant. You know, it's not something, it's not like we walked around saying I'm a Zionist. Mm. But, you know, for, for my family, um, Zionism or, or the state of Israel was actually a miracle. It was like, oh, my God, after everything we've been to, through, you know, now we're able to, um, you know, to we have our own, you know, nation, our own state, our own, you know, place that we, we can go back to the homeland now. And hmm. so it was really kind of a secular thing. It was um, it was a political party originally. So. Anyway, moving forward from that, one of my biggest concerns is I still, and in fact, most of the people that I know, including relatives and, and many friends who actually who live in, in Israel presently, um, you know, they, they don't look at Zionism as this, you know, it's just sort of the right of Jewish people as a nation, as a self-sovereign free people to live in the ancestral historic homeland. And so one of the main concerns that I know many people that I know uh, have is that it's like the conversation about what Zionism is has been usurped by anti-Zionists that many of whom have this really deeply embedded anti-Semitism that they've politicized by using, you know, by using Zionism as an excuse. But they're also very, very concerned about the Netanyahu government, mm -hmm. <laughs> because to them, that's actually not Zionism. I mean, they may call themselves religious Zionists, but to almost everybody that I know, um, what the Israeli government is doing now has nothing whatsoever to do with Zionism. Mm -hmm. So it just makes the conversation really, really confusing when, you know, the Israelis that I know are just saying, I mean, if, if I had to sum up what most of them are saying, it's, you know, um, Netanyahu has to go. And it's also that Hamas has to go. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, that that was one thing. And then I, I did put one question in the chat that I was just hoping that maybe, Yasmin, that maybe you could address a little bit more. I know you did mention it, but I'm wondering if you could discuss the concept of Dimi, as, of Jews as Dimi, a little bit more, because it's my understanding that the biggest problem for Jews, particularly you know, in from the Middle East and North Africa, and you know, like places like it, like in Iraq with the Farhud, and and the Jews that were mm. expelled from the Middle Eastern countries, the problem wasn't so much that they were Jews. The problem was since Israel represented a sovereign state, and the Jews, you know, sort of had mixed allegiance in terms of being, you know, sovereign people and no longer Dimi that that was the problem, that it was more of a threat to Islam and their role as Demi, you know, under Islamic rule, that was the problem that got them expelled. And, you know, rather than them being Jews per se, because as Jews, they were as Demi, as long as they paid their taxes and maintained their status, that, that they were accepted more at least by the governments. I mean, I'm not talking about real people that, you know, probably got along a lot better than 
you know, than we give them credit for. Um, and, you know, and, and I, I don't mean to dominate the conversation, but, I, you know, I feel like I have so many different, you know, questions and thoughts about this. But one, one other thing is, I would like to see more conversation, especially since I've been participating in some of the feminist, uh, forgotten feminist podcasts and, and things like that. I know we often talk about Jews, you know, whether it's in Israel or, you know, in, in the diaspora or anti-Semitism, but at the same time, you know, it, it seems that when we say Palestinians, except in, in conversations like this, we don't often talk about Islam, you know, because when, when you use terms like, if you talk about Arabs or or even Palestinians, that can mean lots of different things, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, but, you know, so I, I think there's the political conversations, but there are also the religious conversations that specifically have to do with, you know, you know, Islam versus, mm -hmm. versus Judaism. Anyway, so, I'll, I'll let you respond thanks. to all that, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's uh, a yeah. lot. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was great. Um, I think, yeah, the, this term Zionism clearly is such a bugaboo for everybody, including me. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, there's a lot to say about. It. I, I would first, I'll say some of the characteristics or, or characterizing of Zionism and how you were introduced to the term, and, and probably me, frankly, to a degree. Like I said, kind of starts after World War II. And it gets so I would first encourage you to kind of look pre 1897 to 1948, but even a little before um, about because I was getting a lot of sort of that prehistory of, of the term. But I think that last thing you brought up actually is the confusion. And it's so hard. So there's a book I'll recommend. It's a tough book. It's just an essay by Shlomo Sand, who's a, a Israeli professor. And he wrote a book called How I Stopped Being a Jew. And it's a funny title, right? Because it's this thing where you're like, wait, how do you stop being a Jew? Is this an ethnicity? Is it a nationality? Is it a political tribe? Is it Zionism? Like what is, which is why to your question of Palestinians and Muslims, like it's easy to become an ex-Muslim. Basically, you can just stop believing and announce it. Can I become an ex-Jew? Okay, <laughs> yeah, <same laughs> right. but can I become an ex-Jew? Yes, can like somebody let me do that? And so Shlomo San wrote this great book called How I Stopped being a Jew, and it really gets into this confusion. And the funny thing is, like, you if you can convert, I'm a, I, I'm an atheist, my parents were atheists, but I have blood in my, my body. Does that make me a Jew? Can I do this thing? So being a secular Jew, can I turn in my card? In fact, the more I complain about being a Jew, they tell me, oh, that's so Jewish. It's such a Jewish thing to like complain. Like it's an inescapable, awful kind of situation. And I desperately want to become an ex-Jew. And he has this funny joke being, it seems the only way to become an ex-Jew is to convert to Judaism and then immediately renounce it. And those would be the only people who would be able to do it. But if you're born into it, I just can't get out of it. And I think this word Zionism has become wrapped into it. And to point to something, I could put some links in. Again, I have a, a bunch of resources on my site, but the Pew Research poll on American Jews in particular, you and I are both uh, American, um, is fascinating on what this question means. What does it mean to be Jewish? It's such a big question. I wrote an essay about it as well. Uh, the, the most popular response is caring about Israel, which to me was always the problem growing up because I had political problems with the project of Israel. So I was like, wait, am I a Am I a Jew? How can I do this? Um, you know, there's funny answers. But the thing about believing in God and the afterlife is like way down the list. In the Orthodox, it's much higher, something like 85%. And those are the same people who also claim a divine right to the land and God gave us the land or whatever. But this whole question and the very first question that Yaz asked me about my upbringing and being a Jew, it probably sounded really common. And this word Zionism is kind of woven into it. And so I think that is you know you're seeing some jews hitting the street saying they're not in our name jews and this kind of stuff i think that's pretty important i think again zionism as a political philosophy has to yaz's point it wasn't it's not doesn't have quite the flavor of jihadism or islamism i'm not trying to be unfair with it to that to those people who, who like the term um but it was a project that successfully wove its way into an ethnicity 
so deeply that now here we are in the year 2024 trying to figure out what the hell it even means and separating it from a religion, from an ethnicity, from a national project. Like I said, is it expansion? Are those Jews saying Netanyahu's not being a good Zionist or something? Because it's so I think the term probably just should be left alone, let alone if I could Velcro it out and turn it into something that actually points to the expansionist project. But I think the bottom line is if it has always been practiced, and this is the hard thing to say, has or for the majority of its existence as a term in practice in the land of Palestine has been practiced in such a way as to be an exclusive or aggressive uh, land project, which was not so keen on living peacefully with its neighbors. I'm not, you know, if it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck. If that's how Zionism has always operated as, that's how I'm kind of using the term. But yes, clearly, if people like the term and they want to use the term, but I am just warning, like I get Yaz's mom saying this thing about like, I hate Zionists, and then just her being confused too of just jamming all Jews into it. But I can tell you as an American Jew, I could travel, well, not now, but when I was in Ramallah and then the West Bank, they don't have a problem with me being a Jew or my last name is Shapiro, about as Jewish as you can get, no problem at all. So, but if I told them, hey, I'm a Zionist, I would have a problem because certainly to them, that means, you know, I support the IDF and I support these settlements and I support this expansion. And generally I support the colonial project of Israel dating back to 1897. It's not heard as sort of the secular life raft for Jews in the world that just needed a safe place to live. Again, if we had a time machine, I would love to see how it would have played out if the Jews ended up in Kenya, Uganda, which frankly was a lot more a land without a people, but uh, maybe it would have gone a little better. Certainly would have been safer, honestly. Um, but they didn't want to do that. And then some, so from the very beginning, it was a little bit of a, um, I don't want to say racist ideology, but it was, it was, you know, supremacist kind of action on the ground. And I don't think Zionism is a term or a concept worth saving. I think Judaism is to answer your question. And if Israel can be saved and the project can redefine itself, it will be the best parts of Jewish values, whatever those are. I'm not, I don't really, I'm not religious at all, but that's what would need to sort of, I don't know, come to the rescue of this kind of maybe optimistic vision that I'm putting out. So I don't, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer, but I don't think Zionism is going to be a satisfying conversation. We, we, we could, we could talk about this. For days, but <laughs> yeah. so, you know, but, 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 thanks but for I, I, I would look at the, the pre-World War II history of Zionism as it operated, because it kind of set the stage, like I said, for many people like us who probably got a little bit on board with a project that we didn't fully understand or were born into a little late. Yeah. And that's... you know, ju just one thing, I, well, mm -hmm. a couple of things I'd like to say if I could about pre-World War II. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, people talk about the Nakba, you know, in 1948. In 1941, the, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem yep. was meeting with Hitler, you know, um, mm -hmm. to collaborate on, on killing Jews. Yeah. You know, both in Palestine, I mean, Hitler used to taunt Jews to go back to Palestine, you know, which was yeah. considered the Jewish homeland. Um, you know, um, yeah, well, whatever. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to dominate the conversation, but, but, but thank you for yeah, yeah, for yeah. At least I have some I have some book recommendations that are, that are interesting about the Mufti as well too. But yeah, it's it's an unforgivable alliance for many, many, many Jews for for yeah. um, obvious so, reasons. Yeah, you know, yeah. And, oh, oh, you know, th there is just one more thing, though. Just one of the reasons, though, I want to point out that, and, and, you know, and I say this from, you know, personal, more or less personal experience. Like I said, I'm first generation Americans, and most of my family were, you know, European, mm. um, you know, I mean, they, they, they were in the places that were experiencing, you know, pogroms and, and, and then the Holocaust. Um, many of the initial Zionists, or, or many of the initial Jews that were anti-Zionist, I should say, were those that were actually trying to assimilate into yeah. the cultures of the different places, the land, you know, their adopted homelands. They were trying to be good citizens and trying to be good nationals. 
So one of the reasons they were opposed to Zionism was because they didn't want to be seen as the elitist, the separatists saying, exactly. oh, we want our own country. They wanted to fit in. But so, you know, it wasn't really until things got really, really bad in yeah. Europe that they were kind of like, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe it's not going to work out for us to be citizens here. So, you know, to, to be fair, I mean, really, in, in my understanding of it, the intentions initially, at least for some of the world and some of the people, was to to provide a safe place because it's kind of like okay if you if you're not accepted anywhere in Europe if you can't live in Arab lands if you can't live anywhere you know why not go back to the historic homeland you know mm. I mean, L- listen to my conversation yeah. with Gideon Levy I think you'll really really enjoy it actually we get into I, this I, a I'm lot and, and he's of your generation and yeah yeah thanks thank you Cindy Mars you're next hey AJ how you doing hey how's it going man um, I have a little bit of an awkward question to, uh, for you, but I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So if I'm misunderstanding your position, interrupt me right away. Um, I, I think you said in your dialogue with Yasmin that you said uh, Israel was a smuggled in colonial project. Um, mm. I don't quite see how that's the case, because I think the the underlying political philosophy of uh, um, this prior to World War II was that especially Woodrow Wilson, he really pushed the idea of self-determination for people mm-hmm. who's bunk, you know, coming out of their, their um, uh, for lack of a better term, their ethnic homelands. And when when Israel was formulated um, from the from the British mandate, there was a there was a special envoy from the UN who, that 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 wanted to do an evaluation of, of that territory. And they more or less claimed to say that both the Palest- the quote unquote Palestinians and the and the the soon to be Israelis had with them equal claims, so they ended up partitioning the land, mm-hmm. and the Palestinians lost that because because of the war that happened afterwards. And what happened was that they, the, the the territory was subsumed by the um by the by the end of the conflict, but but it doesn't change the the idea that the um that they 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 could have had their own state had them mm-hmm. had. Occurred. So I, I don't quite see how that's quite a smuggled in colonial project. Okay. So yeah, no, 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 it's a good question. Um, so I think, well, the Woodrow Wilson thing is interesting. I think uh, as, as just a side note, anybody who's interested in some of this history and how we got here, it's at least in American schools, we don't tend to learn about World War One very much. It's like a lot of World War Two. World War One's this like fuzzy thing with some weird assassination and like no one really, World War One. And two are basically the same war with a long break in between and some like reworking of the alliances. World War One needs to be really understood to understand the Palestine issue that we're in today. And your Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson thing, you're right. So for those uh, in the history lesson, he was he the, the precursor to the UN, the League of Nations, was all about was Woodrow Wilson's baby after World War One ended, and it was all about self determination. Um, it was pretty clear the Europeans were kind of still laughing at Woodrow Wilson's little cute idea of self-determination at the time. But so here, here, here's the case that of the Palestinian mandate being a, a colonial project. Again, 1917, 1897, the British Empire carving up land, which was not even, it was still Ottoman when they were first carving it up along with the, the sykes Pico agreement. Um, I don't know how, what else you call that other than colonial European powers looking at other parts of the land and drawing lines and figuring out who is going to sort of be in charge there. Um, importing a group of Jews from Europe as it to be the people who live on it is interesting. Like I said, from an objective point of view, that is what makes it different than the French in Algeria or something like that. But again, from the Palestinian perspective, they didn't care much. There was certainly a colonial power of the British who were making decisions for them and importing this other group and favoring them. Now, there's arguments about how much the Jews themselves sort of like veered from the British. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, uh, recommendations to not be too aggressive to the local Arab population, but I'm not sure in what way that is not a colonial project from just European powers carving up other areas in the world, including the the, the French in Lebanon. 
um, maybe with a different flavor. And so actually in my in my essay, I also pointed out like not all colonies and especially of the British Empire were exactly the same. They they did this. So I bring up like the case of Uganda, where they imported a large percentage or, or population of Indians to Uganda to sort of be a, a merchant class and they had favorable tax status and whatnot. So now today it's 2024, you have fourth, fifth generation Ugandans who are fully ethnically Indian. But that pro and that that's due to the British. So that's part of a you know, Uganda was a colonial project, and they did this kind of thing. Now they didn't have any plans to hand over the territory of Uganda to you know Indian nationalists who thought it was their ancestral homeland or something. So there's there's differences in the way that the colony colonizing projects operated around the world. But I don't see in what way it's not considered a colonial operation at least a project with yes again the huge important variable that the jews themselves had nowhere else to go and we've already talked plenty about the population itself ashkenazi and all the rest a lot of them unwittingly ended up being the population that ends up there but certainly this was european powers carving up land and redrawing lines on the map which was not unique to that area um Again, from the Palestinian perspective, I don't think it care, they cared too much. I don't know exactly who was doing it to them. There's really interesting, if people are going to go down sort of these rabbit holes, there's a great newspaper that was popular in Palestine called the Palestine with an F um, that had political cartoons. And there was this one where I remember with a big crocodile with like a Jewish star on it and a British, um, a British soldier kind of like having it on a leash. And it's about to like eat the Arab population or whatever. And they're in the, I forget what their the headline on it was or whatever, but it was like the, these colonizers are killing us or something. And it's, this is how they thought. And you have some sympathy from their perspective and their point of view of this, of this project. I mean, are you objecting to it because the British themselves weren't planning on, I don't know, taking over? They were certainly excising taxes and making money off of, <laughs> off of the land. So in that way, it was like any other colonial project. Not not exactly. It's, uh, I, I understand some of the land was that was actually purchased, and, and there, there was actually some kind of claim to it, like mm -hmm. that those that has some basis in, 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 in legitimacy. Now I can understand how the I can understand how the arbitrary division of the land could be considered a colonial project. But if I'm not mistaken, I don't know, and I don't know anything about Pakistan or India, but I understand mm -hmm. there was a similar petition made there, and oh, there right. is there there that could be considered a colonial project in that state of the world. But what I what I see as being very hypocritical is that there's such an undue focus on Israel and Palestine in the area, but almost none of it seems to be directed at, uh, at Pakistan and, Indi and India. Yeah, it, it's, 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 and I forgot it's the other- very, very strange. Yeah, I forgot the other half of your question, which was like, and, I, and this is actually way back to the two-state solution question, because uh, the, if the Arab states, they all voted against the UN resolution to, of the partition, right? Every single Arab state voted against it. The European voted for it, and so did the Americans. And there we were, war the next day. Um, if the Arab states had been like, well, fuck, I guess we're going to get screwed here. Let's just take what they're giving us and call this a state. I think there's a chance that they would have kept it there. Jerusalem was not a part of it at all. It was an international city, right? The very first thing that the Jews did the day after was go straight to Jerusalem, take it and sit on it. And they've never left it since. Netanyahu, many years later, you know, made that famous speech after the assassination and, you know, said the Jews will never leave Jerusalem. And again, I think that's kind of the crown jewel in, in the kingdom. Um, but yes, there, there were purchases made and there was a mix of things, they, but who were they purchased from, right? Like, and, and this, that, that also has an interesting history. There were some very wealthy Arab landowners who owned the land and sold it to Jews and whatnot. And Rothschilds were involved in some of that as well. Um, but yeah, so the, I, I think what your question is also sort of pointing to is one of the really common questions about why the UN is so focused on Israel and Palestine. It always gets charged with anti-Semitism because it's like, man, they're, you know, every other resolution's about Israel and Palestine, and they don't seem to care much about all these other awful things in the world. And there might be some small truth to that. But the bigger truth is that Israel-Palestine was the first project 
of the UN and has always been this thorn in the side of this thing that, the, I mean, the first big project of the UN, 1948, it was a brand new toy for the world to see what they could really. And when you go back and look at the partition, I think it looks crazy to us now to think like that they thought that this could work or they had this kind of power as this new organization. Um, so the UN's legitimacy from day one, I think, has been staked on the Israel-Palestine partition plan or some sort of peace there being feasible. And as, as it crumbles, the UN legitimacy, of course, is also going to crumble. So I think the fact that they're so obsessed on it, the fact that the ICJ is talking about it again now, makes total sense from just like this rational, like, this is their baby, this is their project. And all of these resolutions they they keep passing, if we're going to be have a global rules-based world order that we keep hearing about, then something like Resolution 242, with the one that's currently being, it's a slam dunk case at the ICJ that the occupation and the settlement is a violation of it. Is that going to mean anything? Or are we just going to sort of shrug and be like, nah, you know, we're just going to, these rules really don't mean anything. So I don't know if that answers the question. I know I didn't really get to India, Pakistan. But um, yeah, again, just if Mars, think of it from the Palestinian perspective of watching powerful countries on Earth in Europe carve up your land, French, Britain, and people showing up and taking your land. Sometimes, yes, buying it where the wealthy person is like, hey, I, I bought this from the dude who owns the farm that you're on and we're just going to live here now. Maybe that has a little more legitimacy to it. Obviously, there's a, I don't want to cast 1948 and the creation of state of Israel to only being massacres or only being purchases. It was a mix of a lot of different ways to acquire land. So, yeah. But without the British, it never happens. Without the British, it never happens. That's for sure. We good, Mars? <laughs> I'm not good with it, but it's the best I can do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, David, are you okay with uh, unmuting yourself and and maybe reading your comment out? Because I think that's really interesting, and I'm I'm really glad to see you here. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, basically, what I'm saying, I should add here, I'm uh, speaking to you from South Africa, which has been in the news regarding Israel Palestine. And the case before the ICJ, as you all know, uh, thank you to Jay and Yasmin, the conversation and others who have given their input. But to Jay and to Yasmin, she mentioned her mother, uh, seems obsessed about Jews in a negative way. Um, she may want to give input. Basically, as I've said in the comment, Yes, the Palestinians are oppressed and their cause is legitimate. It's not inherently anti-Semitic. But in my experience, your chances of running into anti-Semitism in one form or another in Palestinian associated activities are pretty good. It does come up. And for me, speaking just for myself, uh, it's very off-putting. Mm -hmm. I may say so. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 really off putting, and it's a problem. Um, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not sure how to answer the question there, but it is a it is a legitimate uh, concern. Obviously, I mean, I think it relates to what I've been talking about of Zionism and Judaism, and what's the difference, and that mixture. Um, because it's, for example, it was on the ADL website today. We all, we hear anti-Semitism is going up and up and up and up. And then you look at all of what they're trying to, what they've reported as anti-Semitic incidences. And like 80% of them are clearly things where people were attempting to be anti-Israel or anti-Zionist. However, whatever language fits for them there, it's like, I don't like how that state is operating. I don't like the history of that state. I don't think the Jews should all die. I think Jews are are, are fine people and we we need to figure this out. It's that's a it's a hard thing to express. I mean, I'm giving you my frustration from my entire life of how difficult it's been to express as a Jew who might have some shield 
against being called an anti-Semite. I get called a self-hating Jew a lot more than I get called an anti-Semite, but I can get called an anti-Semite plenty. Um, it is so uh, difficult. The symbol, one of the primary symbols of Judaism, the Star of David, is in the center of the flag. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna quickly try to like hold up a sign that says I don't support Israel and I have an Israeli flag with a line through it or blood dripping off of it or something, and someone's like that's anti-Semitic because it probably conjures images of Nazi Germany and um, car political cartooning, which has an ugly history or stuff. Well, is it anti-Semitism? Like how how do I express or how does someone, especially who's not Jewish, somebody especially who's Palestinian, express their anger, frustration, hatred for Judaism, or sorry, for Zionism and the Israeli project that doesn't get confused with being hate, you know, being hateful for towards Jews. And I do not doubt to answer your question that that sometimes goes over some fault line and some trip line where maybe like Yaz's mother, where it completely erases and it's just Jews. And I don't draw a distinction between them. I don't know if that happens first or second, you know, hatred of that way is complicated, but it's certainly a real phenomena that must require, I don't know your case in South Africa of just racism against the Bantu or whatever it was, you know, at, at, at some, how would somebody be expressing like, you know, they're fine people, but I just don't like when they're violent and blowing up church street or something like that. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's obviously a level of it. And as Yaz knows very well with my work and my history, um, there is an unfortunate amount of uh, justification for it in the holy doctrine that is readily available to find and amplify and spread. And so it probably is, it, it's at a higher ambient level than it would be in certain other, you know, populations. Um, but yeah, I, I, I guess your question is like just addressing that. And I certainly am, I don't want to deny its existence, but I do think it's important for all of us to try to decipher and keep our eye on what is anti-Israel, what is, you know, even saying, saying like, I think this is a genocide. Is that anti-Semitic? I don't know. Right. And it's so, just, yeah, you're, you're shaking your head, incorrect. but I think that's been confused my whole, my whole life. And I think we just have to be, we have to be pretty strict about that at the moment. And then maybe we'll get a better idea of like, who are the real anti-Semites here? <laughs> and who are the ones who are actually just, you know, not happy with the political situation and or the history. Um, I blame, I blame, I blame that a lot on my upbringing, which intentionally blurred that line, because it knew it was a good defense and protection. I think in Germany now, which has obvious ghosts of uh, awful anti-Semitism. It's really bad. I mean, waving the Palestinian flag, I think might still be illegal right now. And this is just bonkers. And of course, the worst part is it will actually make the anti-Semitism worse and get higher because you're like, you know, what are they afraid of? Jews control the world. You get all that kind of stuff behind it. So again, in that Gideon Levy conversation, I've pitched it a few times now because I think it was so good. He, It's a really hard line. He's like, don't be surprised when anti-Semitism gets worse because of what is Israel's doing. And it's, 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 there's truth to it, but it's awful because it sounds like victim blaming and whatever else. Um, but that's where we're at. Yeah, that was a pretty bleak answer. <laughs> but yes, yeah, it's real. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for bringing that up, David. It's an important point. And it reminded me of one I wanted to make earlier in the conversation with you, Jay, but um, mm. I forgot. Um, so Sam, as you know, will be coming on this podcast in a couple of weeks, so I'll let him speak for himself. But you did mention <clears throat> that just because you're like, I, I think what you were saying was Sam re regards Islamists as a much bigger problem than mm -hmm. Zionism. And that's why he's and uh, it's hard to disagree with him on that. We've got a couple of Iranians on the call with us here, and it's not just that they hate Jews. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've seen the, the Houthi flag, right? It's not just death to Israel, and it's death to America. You were talking about, do they hate the Brits more? Do they hate the Jews more, like, for coming? doesn't matter. They hate them all. They want them all dead. It's all, you know, it's 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 everybody that isn't Muslim, and and Muslim enough. Even, even some Muslims aren't Muslim enough. If you're Shia, you should also be killed. Or if you're not following, you know, if you're not wearing hijab properly, or 
blah, 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 a million different things. Or if you're gay, like there's a gajillion different reasons why they would also kill Muslims. Um, so it's, it, they are a much bigger global problem. And I think if you're going to, it, it doesn't necessarily mean like you were saying that you have to go and say, okay, well, then I'm going to support Israel. But there is some, some understanding that in this, you know, currently, Israel really is a bulwark against Islamism in the Middle East right now. It really is not, they're not just protecting their own citizens. Um, like Biden said, they're protecting not just American interests, but British interests, everybody's interests, who isn't, um, who isn't going to be part of the, the caliphate. Yeah. Sarah. So what? So why oh, did? Sorry. Um, and that was, so why did the Ayatollah rise to power when he did? Did it have anything to do with Israel and geopolitics? No, it had to do with America supporting them because the they <laughs> hated the Shah, and well, they hated Russia. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was you know, and so they, it was like the. It's the same thing that they did in Afghanistan too, right? Yeah. When they supported the Mujahideen. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying America isn't involved and I'm not saying these aren't like geopolitical issues yeah. that are complicated. And each one, of course, is going to be a little bit different. But what I am saying is when you're going to talk about yes. yeah. how, what you perceive as the problem of Zionism, and I get what you're, I, I will agree with you insofar as you are correct, that it will constantly be a reason for them mm -hmm to point to this area of land and say, this is where we need to go. This is where we're going to spend our money. This is where we're going to start bombing and killing people because it's like, there's that grievance is there yeah. and the conflict is there. So it's a good excuse, you know, and just like I mentioned, the same thing they did in Iraq, the same thing they did in Libya. Like they just, they look for any opportunity for any kind of strife for them to go running in there and trying to, to yeah. build their caliphate. I mean, who support who's the one who funded Hamas? It was the Iranian regime. And why? Mm -hmm. Why would they? These are Sunnis and they're Shias because at the end of the day, the Jews I'm an enemy. The, the yeah. enemy of my enemy. Yeah. So they'll they'll kill the Jews first, get rid of all of you know, all of them first. The Sunnis will eventually kill off the Shias or the Shias will kill off the Sunnis, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but this Here's, is what they do. They they form yeah. alliances. This is what they're doing here right now. And this is what they did in Iran um, when the Islamic regime got into power. They also formed alliances with the Marxists and the socialists and the, and the communists. Um, yeah. And they got rid of them as soon as they, they didn't need them anymore. Here, here's how I'll answer it. I hear you loud and clear. And uh, I know Sam's coming on here as well. And yeah, for those who don't know, I work with Sam. This is all friendly behind closed doors. We've had some of these conversations. So I know some of this stuff. Um, I think the fairest version of his argument is the one you laid out. Like I said, I know jihadism and Islamism are real phenomena that are huge, right? I do think he forgets to factor in Zionism with the backing of the largest uh, military on earth and before that, the largest British empire on earth. Regardless of that, I do not doubt anything you just said. And it's huge, right? It's it's a, an aggressive, big problem. It's a chip on its shoulder that has religious power to spread. And I've mentioned the doctrine and stuff a few times. So to his credit, I think the best version of his argument is regardless of how it appears in the world due to geopolitics or all the history I laid out or anything else, regardless, once it pops up and appears in the world, it is such a, you know, like I said, all bets are off. And it's such a big problem that we're just in an emergency and we're going to do the best we can and get rid of it. And, um, you know, ethical countries will try to do that with as little collateral damage as we can. Judge for yourself how Israel is doing on that. There's a lot of reasons. And I get my argument of like, let's be honest that all tribes are capable of extermination for the wrong reasons, not just because it's collateral damage. But let's just say that's what we could do. And let's say we could do it with a military um, operation. I think even Sam is skeptical that that can be done. But, it, you know, I don't know if he's fully on board with what's happening in Gaza. But 
yeah, the best version of the argument is that once it appears, doesn't really matter how we got to this trolley problem, we have to solve it. And there's going to be a mess because war is messy and we're probably going to make some mistakes. And yeah, there's a few bad apples and we'll try our best to, uh, you know, discipline the ones who get out of hand. And that's what really separates us from the other guys. Um, if that's the uh, argument, like I said, if that's the honest argument someone wants to make, okay, then we could just disagree about practicalities. We could disagree about whether they're doing it ethically. We could disagree about why the settlements are continuing to expand because that doesn't seem to factor into anything I just said, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then make that on that, that argument honestly and say history does not matter at all and don't bring it up. And Sam's, uh, and this is not to pick on him, like I, I said in my piece, um, his knowledge of the history of it is awful. It's lacking and he's wrong about it. And I think that matters. Again, it might not matter to the trolley problem if once you get there, but I want to understand how jihadism appears in the world just as, a, as much as I wanted to understand how Nazism appeared in the world as a young Jewish kid who was being told you know, Hitler is a monster and a devil, and that's all you need to know. Anti-Semitism is just this evil thing that exists in the world. Well, again, you don't always know the truth as a kid, but you know when you're being bullshitted to, and that's bullshit. Monsters don't exist. There's reasons, human reasons, and explanations yeah, for why I'll and how you, Nazi I'll Germany. Tell you why. Well, not Nazi Germany, but I'll tell you jihadis <laughs> and, and Islamists. Um, yeah. So first of all, jih jih that's that was like when Muhammad's body was still warm that mm -hmm. Muslims yes. started killing each other. Like it was like immediate. Yeah. So that, and and then the, the killing to spread Islam that happened while Muhammad was alive as well. Like that jihad is, a, is an inherent part of mm -hmm. the religion. Like it's integral. Um, but Islamism is something that came about after the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. So when the empire fell, they were like, okay, well, how are we going to get into uh, Europe? How are we going to continue to expand our empire? get Spain back. That's all they ever talk about. Freaking, they're, they're obsessed with that, right? The golden age of Islam was when uh, when they had Andalusia. Um, and so they, they got together and they said, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this without doing it the way we did before? We can't spread the Islam via the sword. We can't do it the jihadi way. Let's find a new way. And that's when they came up with, this is Hassan al-Banna, right? You know all this mm -hmm, stuff mm -hmm. already. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's when they came up with the the Islamist strategy of uh, you know different ways through immigration, through the wombs of Muslim mothers, th through using secular laws against themselves. Uh, they called it their hundred year plan, um, and it's uh, that's how that started basically. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah, to like I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is I think you and I the most tragic pictures are the, are the ones of like Afghanistan in the 60s or Palestine. There's a cool band I've been listening to from Palestine in the 60s. Like they were wearing bell bottoms and pretending they were the Beatles like every other country on earth and generally participating with this post-World yeah. War II. And it's Iran. Everyone has seen the before and after photos, right? And it's just heartbreaking, right? Because you're like, man, what happened? And we all want, we're like, how do we get back to that moment? Syria, Iran Beirut happened. was like... Yeah, Iran happened. That was the first huge domino. <laughs> Honestly, it really was, right? Yeah. And America's finger pointed at Sarah mistakes. like it's her fault. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> she was the one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but but yes, it, but to your point of of jihad sort of being so what I what I am what I want to know and understand, especially from someone like Sam, is is knowing and understanding the history is everything that I've laid out with the history here tonight. Is that, at, at the very least, an important thing to know, an important factor to figure out how we don't get ourselves into this trolley problem in the future, even if we have to go through hell? And he might. I mean, I don't know if he would just say it right now. He, I think he's kind of, in so many words, endorsing ethnic cleansing by other other words at this point of, I think, voluntary migration or something like that. Um, again, that is a solution. That is a solution to this problem. I don't want it to be the one that we go through. Um, but uh, even if whatever we have to do, again, I'm giving Sam all the benefit of the doubt here of knowing very much that jihad is or a death cult, as he often likes to say, and, uh, you know, probably can't be reasoned out of anything that I just said and, and would, you know, no matter what solution to the two state or whoever asked, 
would never be satisfied because it's an infidel problem and it's get off the holy land. Mm -hmm. Like I understand all of that. And it's a real phenomenon. I don't think it's as big of a variable as he thinks it is. And we have to account for the times within Muslim communities and nations where it, I agree with you, didn't disappear. It kind of can't disappear, but ebbed to a point where it was dormant. really, yeah, really dormant. And it's something to always sort of watch out for. I am not, uh, you know, my work, I am not trying yeah. to pretend yeah. that, right, that the doctrines don't matter here and every religion's all the same. And I think that is a huge, a huge mistake. So actually, you know, I want to put this out because I wonder how long your audience has been following you and people like me who've been, in, we've been in this conversation a long time. And someone like Sam, um, again, not trying to pick on him here. He's a he's a friend, but burst onto the scene at a moment after 9-11 when the mantra of the Western world after the towers fell was this has nothing to do with Islam. And it wasn't all the left saying it, right? George W. Bush was the first person to say it. And it was very it was kind of like we all hoped that was true. And it would it was almost, I bet Mars in this conversation, other people I know have been, it was almost a litmus test of like anybody who would speak about the problem, if you answered that question wrong, of like, if you said this has nothing to do with Islam, basically you're out. Like you didn't pass the litmus test and you're out. Sam passed it and very few people were passing it at that time. And Sam was one of them. So was Christopher Hitchens, who I really wish we had today. It would be great to hear his opinion on all, on all of this. But I think now we're at this point so many years later where you don't hear that as much. I think people know it has something to do with Islam, right? We're not totally hearing that as much, but some still. But now the question is, wait, it's almost the reverse of like, does this have not, does this have nothing to do with geopolitics? And I'm getting worried that some people are saying, well, no, it has nothing to do with geopolitics, or they're saying the geopolitics don't matter at all because jihadism is such a problem, which is a little bit more of the more honest argument. But I don't think it is because especially, and again, not picking on him, but especially when he displays ignorance about the history, then I'm like, well, I think understanding the history, at least at least know what you're dismissing. If you think the history doesn't matter and everything I said was interesting and academic, but kind of doesn't matter because we have an emergency now and we have people who want to blow themselves up in the name of God, fine, but at least know what you're dismissing there. And then we could have that debate. And that's really why I jumped into these conversations. You know me, I like being on, I hate doing this. <laughs> I told you this before we started recording. I kind of started doing things a little more publicly publicly again because I've been disappointed with some of the people with bigger platforms. Um, I like being behind the scenes and helping people shape their ideas and this kind of stuff. Um, but here I am and I'm just frustrated. I'm frustrated with that. And I, I, I hate hearing the kind of arguments that I'm hearing about something that I am intimately close with. And you and I, we, we talked about this off camera that I haven't talked about in a really long time. I walked away from the Israel problem when I was like 20 because it was too frustrating with my parents, with my mom. We would fight about it all the time. And she one time finally told me, this actually I think will relate to one of the first questions we got. She gave me this very kind of heartbreaking and beautiful expression. She said, Jay, um, I love Israel, or she said, ceasing my support and love for Israel would be like amputating a body part. It's that deep in her soul. It's that much a part of her identity. And I, and it's a halting image. And I just stopped because I'm like, okay, I get it. We're not going to do this. And I, and I kind of walked away and I actually regret it now, which is one of the things I wrote about. I think Ezra Klein's been feeling a little bit of this too lately. Um, because understanding the geopolitics, the American Jew holds a pretty big lever in this situation. And I feel some regret for having sort of stepped away from it. And now the, the analogy she's using, because she's struggling. I bet a lot of people on this call are struggling with what's happening. We don't like seeing what we're seeing, even if we think there's good reasons for it, or we had no other choice, or Sam Harris style, that it's a trolley problem that we just had to solve. Um, but we don't like seeing it. No one likes seeing dead babies, uh, but we're seeing a lot of them. Um, and so the way she's expressing it now as she's struggling is she's saying, I love Israel like I love a child who's committed a crime, meaning like a child who's in jail. You know, she thinks of there's 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 women out there who have sons who've murdered people and they're sitting in jail. And it's like, you know, she's like, how does the mother still love that child? 
but you do and you feel it. And that's, that's where she's at with Israel. Um, and it's again, an interesting and halting analogy that she's working through. And I think, unfortunately, Israel is still a little on the loose <laughs> and not quite in jail. That's why I'm like, we just need to stop. And yes, Hamas returned the hostages. Let's just stop and put everybody in jail for a second and actually take a breath and figure out we love everybody here. How do we how do we figure it out? But that's that's maybe a, a personal side note and diatribe that veered off of of, of Sam's argument there. But um, yeah, that's that's why I'm here talking. I, I, I feel like I need to. Thank you, Jay. Sarah. Jasmine, hi. Hi, Jay. Hi. We've been talking about two hours, 20 minutes. Do you have time? Because if, if you want to stop it, like you talked about most of the things I wanted to talk about in this last part. It's just I think very... you'll be the last question. <laughs> so to start this, I'm going to preface with this. I'm against ethnic cleansing. I'm against genocide. We are all against murder. I come from Iran. Yasmin knows my story. Some of the people who are here already know, know my story. And you warned about don't become Zionists if you're trying to support. And I understand that conundrum, but mm. right now I'm fighting with Islamists and Muslims. And for me, there's no distinction between the two. I know some people have the privilege. I've mentioned before, I don't have the privilege. I'm an ex-Muslim. They'll kill me where I stand, so they don't care. I'm fighting with the woke left liberal Westerners mm. around the world who want to silence me and they use Islamophobia the same way they use Zionists. And now I have to be worried about whether I become a Zionist and I've been called a Zionist so many times because I find this deplorable that they are spitting at the women's bodies in the back of the trucks. Mm. And I understand that, that young children and a lot of people that are innocent are dying in Gaza. But if I sit here and say, I find this, this deplorable and that makes me a Zionist, I'll take that. I'll take that because that would be a badge of honor for me. I mm. understand the, the um, I understand the history behind it. I understand the connotations behind it. But people who throw Zionists at my face, they do it to belittle me and degrade me. And I don't like that because it's the same way they use Islamophobe. And Going back to what you said, you said women will be screwed. We have already been screwed. I know. I've that before. <laughs> I'm 41 years old, and it feels like I've been fighting for 45 years because that's how long the Islamic regime has been in Iran. It's generational. So I do not accept that premise. Going forward, if, I'm ha if I have to fight everybody at every front, I want my human dignity. I don't want a peace that does not include women and their safety. And for whatever reason, if we have to all kill each other, okay, let's all kill each other. Because if that's the solution that women will keep getting screwed, but we won't have more murders. Well, we are already getting murdered. So yeah. I, I don't, I can't accept that premise, unfortunately. And I appreciate everything that you're talking about. I appreciate the history and I appreciate like all of this, but if going forward, your peace or the world peace, not just you, does not include us in it. Sorry, I yeah. don't want it. Uh, that is perfect because that, I told you this was the question and the conversation I was afraid of because I don't have much for you other than. I tried like, not to raise. No, my no, no, no. I tried to be silent for the whole thing, but at no, the end it, I, it is. It, it was. It was ab <laughs> absolutely. Knows. No, it was absolutely perfect. I'll tell you as like a side note, I was like, when I saw what was happening in Iran a year ago or so, and clearly, you know, we were, I was having a dinner conversation with this and I was like, I'm, re I'm done. I'm ready to fucking cut off heads now. Like, this is it. I'm fucking tired of this too. So just and believe me. Really, like, they're the only people who stood by us. Yes. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. I know. Like, I know. There's I get no it. Arab nation who stood by us and helped us. And I'm not talking about the 45 years that's been by, through the past year and a half. Israelis have been unconditionally kind, yes. supportive, and loving. I, I, I would. So I, my only thing is like, it's impossible to say, but it's be, it's like, be patient. I mean, if if you're convinced that all of some of what I laid out, and I'm like, I, the day that you and I won is the same day, and how do we get to it as quickly as possible? And I'm telling you, so 9/11 happens, and America goes crazy, right? And we go on a rampage. What people will remember in the Arab world was Abu Ghraib. 
That was the biggest recruiting event of all time for, for jihadism until Gaza. This is the biggest recruiting event of all time, the big, biggest radicalization event for Muslims that we've probably seen since Muhammad. <laughs> and that's like, I don't know what to tell you. So every time, so in my essay, what to watch out for, um, I don't even want to say what Zionism. It's something called tribal essentialism. I laid it out in this piece that I think you'd find it inter interesting to watch because I don't think Sam Harris is a racist. I don't think a lot of these people are racist. I think they're tribal essentialists, which means I defined it as something like it's it's skipping over a whole category of, of possible intentions and motivations when it concerns the behavior of your own tribe. That category is, um, you know, vengeance, martyrdom, hateful, uh, you know, all the ugly things, you just kind of, you just jump over it and you go right to all the rational reasons for your tribe behaving in such ways. Jews are just like everybody else. And they are capable of killing a Palestinian baby because it's a Palestinian. And they are capable of, uh, to a smaller degree, as, as we pointed out, but capable of divine commandment to take people's land and burn olive trees and everything else. They are capable of that. Is it as big a phenomenon? No, I don't think so, but they are absolutely capable of doing it. And so every time they're spitting at a Palestinian or whatever, we could be like, ah, you know, war is messy and they just got really angry or these awful IDF channels, like the 72 virgins channel that finally the IDF admitted that they were running where they're like celebrating the crunching of grandma's bones about like ugly, ugly, ugly stuff. I know you and I want to turn away from it because you're like, damn it, they're fighting the people that I need them to fight. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what to tell. I, I think what I what I tried to do was give so much of that history to try to understand the leg, the legitimate frustrations of the Palestinian cause, which is as Yasmin pointed out, and we all agree, is hijacked by Islamists and jihadists often. And it's the worst thing for them. And it's they haven't always been this way. I put a lot of blame on Israel's history for squashing plenty of secular, peaceful attempts at resistance. These have been well documented. Unfortunately, it's not always supported. Um, and but now here we are, and I hear you, and I'm just as frustrated as you. So I'm just trying. I'm. I feel fucking awful saying these kinds of things because I'm like Jesus Christ. Do I want Joe Biden or Tr Donald Trump to win? I fucking hate Donald Trump, but I'm like, how do we? What's the path to get to the day that you and I want as fast as possible? And I'm unfortunately convinced that that is, like I keep saying, a radical redefinition of what Israel is. I don't think Iran gets the revolution it deserves until Israel redefines itself. And we're just we're just so fucking stuck now in this place. Like I laid out because I think that history matters, right? Because of that line by Netanyahu. It's funny. He's not saying the Palestinians don't have a legitimate cause to a state. He's saying, I don't want to reward terrorism, even though maybe he pushed them into it is what they would say, right? It's a common strategy. Well, that's exactly how the Palestinians feel because they go, they have longer memories and they go back to 1897 and they're like, this is an act of colonial terrorism. That's put it on me. I don't want to give this reward either. Yes, me knows plenty of people in this call that know this, that the Palestinians get treated like garbage in a lot of places, including like Lebanon, because if you give a Palestinian a job, it means you've given a win to the Zionists because they want the Palestinians to just give up and leave and get out. So they are used as pawns in this way, but people are stuck in this fight where they don't want to reward terrorism <laughs> to the other side. And so <laughs> I don't want either of the side to win that battle. That's why I'm like, fuck it, call it something else. One state, they both lose or they both can claim they win. And I think um, at that point, finally, Iran, and many of the other Islamist regimes, including Egypt, all of these hopeful moments we had in the Arab Spring or whatever, really start to deliver. I mean, as the most hopeful thing, Yaz knows this too, I made this prediction that we're going to live through the biggest liberation of women in the history of the planet. But I don't think it happens until Israel radically redefines itself. So I, whether that's hard to swallow or not, I, you could you could disagree with it. It's, it's an argument that could be disagreed I with. But it's but it's a it's a it's a warning I think that if you, if you get on board with the Zionist project as is, and just give in to that anger, we're we're just going to entrench it even further, even if you, you it might be safer for Israelis. So I, you know I don't know I don't know how to get there. We're we're on the same I just, team. I just want to yeah. I want to remind you, Jay, that even if this whole Israel project were to dissolve 
and Iran didn't have that as an excuse anymore. They're just going to move on. I told you they they don't only hate the Jews. They don't only hate Israel. They're going to there's they go going to be another 9/11. America, yes. Britain, I worry. anywhere. Yeah. I yeah. worry. Yeah. No, not, I think the next decade they're is They're not going to be like, well, suck. we're good now. <laughs> like they're they're they will keep going. They will, that is They have their... the money, they have the land, they have the resources, they have the power. They're not going anywhere until they kill all the 70 million people who do not agree with them. Yeah. Well, there's going to be an ethnic cleansing in Iran as it's been happening. Yeah, it, it's going to be very like I like I said a couple of times here, I'm going to sound like a lunatic to all of you people over the next 10 years, because I think it's going to get really bad. And I, I wish it didn't have to be this way. It's just my prediction of how do we get there as fast as possible. And I do think it's going to be a really awful bumpy ride. Just remember decade for now. Don't remember it when yeah, I worry every day, Yaz, yes, that Al-Qaeda, Al -Qaeda, like shit really hasn't started to blow up yet in Europe or the US because of this. Of course, it's something's going to happen. And that response is going to be worse. I mean, America is getting dragged in day by day, little by little. Um, yeah, that I don't know what to tell you, but I, do, I don't disagree with you. Yes, I just I just hope that Islamists flame out because they used they to not be in power they won't they won't flame it, out and they're allying with russia and with china yes. and they're His, making history sure has a long they... scale His, history has yeah. a very long memory if, if we go the other way the final line that sam uses in all these essays is the whole world is israel we just haven't realized it yet and it's a powerful line and it's a scary as hell line now because i do think we're at we keep saying we're at this moment where it's like all right ethnic cleansing or we figure out how to live together and if he's right just scale that up to the world because we live in a world Israel is right next to you know the the problem and so they deal with it but the world can reach each other with missiles and bombs a lot closer and so are we just going to ethnically cleanse the entire world and go on with ourselves again go back to the trail of tears it's the historical precedence politics is the problem of how to align present behavior with its relationship with history and history is long and it doesn't forget and so I'm throwing a hail mary here because I'm trying to avoid World War III, but I, but I but I don't know if it's avoidable. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. on the other side of it is this better vision of things. That uh, it's an awful thing to say, but it's it's a it's a bleak moment that we're at. I don't know. Sorry, sir. <laughs> I'm with you. Like I fucking feel it. I'm really really with you. Yeah. Inshallah, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I think that's what we said in our <laughs> in yeah. Um. So. Uh, thank you so much for giving us so much of your time. This is officially the longest Yasmin yes, Mohammed podcast. Send me a trophy. Um, yes, <laughs> you win. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that I give you the last word, a bit of advice or letting people know where they can find you, the name of your podcast. I don't think you've ever mentioned it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Any last words that you have with folks before I conclude? I've said enough. I appreciate everybody giving me the space in the ear. I obviously have a lot on my mind. Um, Yaz and I are good old friends, and this is fun just to talk and catch up because we we've been we've been through this and it's getting it's getting bad. But uh, I I keep a website called whatjthinks.com, pretty easy to remember, and a podcast called Dilemma, which really is fun and not about this kind of stuff at all. Usually, it's a philosophy podcast where we deal with ethical dilemmas and all kinds of fun stuff. If you go through the archive. And it was pretty dormant, but I jumped back in with these conversations, the ones uh, that I've recommended with what I'm calling the Palestine Collection, which was an essay that I did. Uh, then I released a conversation with Gideon Levy. Today, I have a conversation with Richard English, which is fantastic. He's an academic uh, in the UK who takes on the question that I think everybody is secretly asking but afraid to do out loud, which is, does terrorism work? And it's not yes, particularly it about, right? And it's not only about Hamas, uh, Israel, that question he writes about um, the IRA and the Basque movement in Spain and Al-Qaeda and stuff. Fascinating academic and insanely important question. Uh, and then tomorrow or maybe Monday, I'm releasing a conversation with Miko Pellet. And then to tease it at the end of that little collection, because then I'll probably not do a bunch of shows in a while. I'm challenging myself here. This is to you, Sarah, or whatever. And to maybe a lot of people who thought it was interesting what I said, but you know, doesn't really go anywhere is um, it's really easy to criticize. It's really easy to throw spitballs from the back of the room and be like, oh, Sam's wrong and this is wrong and Zionism sucks, whatever. What's really hard to do is figure out what to what to say. And so I've challenged myself to be like, what speech would I give on October 8th, 2023 in 
Tel Aviv to my country. Um, there's two ones. It'll be like what I wish could be said, and then what actually maybe practically could be said. So I'm going to challenge myself to to write write something wow. because it's impossible. But I think that's good for everybody here to try to do. Of like, we're, it's easy for us to criticize and you know do all that, but it's it's hard to figure out what to do and what to say and how to get out of these situations. So I'm going to try, and it'll probably be a mess, but. Um, That'll be like putting my money where my, my mouth is with everything I just said. So there you go. Awesome. Thank you so much. And that will be released because I'm really looking forward to that. Is that going to be just, on Dilemma? Yeah. Yeah. I'll do it in audio. Okay. Yeah. On Dilemma podcast. Okay. Uh, yeah. You could find those. And and yeah, it's all on whatjthinks.com. I also do some writing and stuff on there. And most of the time in my life, I do films about other stuff. That's like super fun. So you could also keep an eye on that. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much yeah. again, Jay. I really appreciate it. There's a lot of accolades for you in the in the chat there. A lot of people just sending their love and appreciation. And, oh, thank you. you. Know, yeah. Gratitude for uh for your discussion with us here today. Um, and I extend that as well, especially for giving us so much of your time. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who has joined us. And uh we'll see you next time. <laughs>